It's time for Twit This Week in Tech. Boy, is this a show you're going to want to stay tuned for. What a panel. Uh, Jeff Jarvis is here from This Week in Google. Brianna Wu, founder of Rebellion Pack, former congressional candidate. Alex Stamos, who has had gigs at Facebook uh, and Google and Zoom uh, and is now a security and trust expert, professor at Stanford and the director of Stanford's Internet Observatory. We're going to talk about the rise of the Twitter replacements, particularly about Blue Sky, trust and safety issues across the board, the disaster that is looming with the 2024 election, and then we're going to celebrate the 30th birthday of the World Wide Web, all that and more coming up next on Twit. Podcasts you love from people you trust. This, this is Twit. Twit. This is Twit. This Week in Tech, episode 925, recorded Sunday, April 30th, 2023. Gradually, then suddenly. This Week in Tech is brought to you by Stamps.com. Set up your business for success when you start today. Sign up with a promo code TWIT and you'll get a special offer that includes a four-week trial, free postage, and a free digital scale. Just go to Stamps.com. Click the microphone at the top of the page and enter the code TWIT. And by ACI Learning. Oh, if you love IT Pro, you will love ACI Learning. ACI Learning offers fully customizable training for your team in formats for all types of learners across audit, cybersecurity, and IT. From entry-level training to putting people on the moon, ACI Learning has you covered. Visit go.acilearning.com slash twit to learn more. And by Noom. Stop chasing health trends and build sustainable, healthy habits with Noom's psychology-based approach. Check out Noom's first ever book, The Noom Mindset, a deep dive into the psychology of behavior change. Available to buy now wherever books are sold. Don't forget to sign up for your trial at Noom.com slash twit. And by Lookout. Whether on a device or in the cloud, your business data is always on the move. Minimize risk, increase visibility, and ensure compliance with Lookout's unified platform. Visit Lookout.com today. It's time for Twit This Week in Tech, the show where we cover the week's tech news. I have the best panel ever. I'm so excited to say hello to Alex Stamos, who is here from the Internet Observatory. <laughs> Sounds like you got a telescope and you're looking at the, uh, it's the Stanford Internet Observatory. What do you observe there, Alex? Uh, we are a multidisciplinary group that looks at the abuse of the Internet uh, and different kind of technical and oh, policy mitigations. Abuse. Abuse. Alex is a very well-known security guru. Uh, we, we had so much fun with you on This Week in Google a few months ago. We said, yeah. we got to get Alex uh, back in. And if we're going to get Alex back in, we better have Mr. Jeff Jarvis here to join him. Hello, Jeff. Buzzmachine.com. Well, well, Alex is wearing a real, you know, man's T-shirt. I, however, am wearing... Oh, a oh. Twit 10. T-shirt. Well, that was a, almost a decade ago, the 10th like, anniversary like of Twit. It was a long time ago. We are now in... How, uh, old, is this, how old is this enterprise? We had our 18th uh, birthday while I was gone a couple uh, of weeks old ago. Old enough to drink. Yeah. Vote. Two Something. years, we'll do the 20th, and I'll get you a T-shirt. How about that? <laughs> how about that? Uh, and, yeah, Alex, we should mention, is wearing a, a gold... Uh, I'm sorry, Sacramento Kings shirt because... And we have a big screen just for Alex. One of the conditions of his appearance here <laughs> was that he could watch the final Game 7 of the NBA semifinals the warriors and the kings it's a it's a bay area extravaganza yeah nor, nor cal uh, and you know frankly we're not much farther from the kings than we are from the warriors i could go either way on this yeah show. no and here in petaluma yeah, yeah. no it's could, beautiful yeah i grew up in sacramento uh my dad had season tickets since like 1987 oh. or so so that means oh, i've seen neat. about 150 wins 300 losses uh, <laughs> <laughs> hey, the Warriors were the Warriors went through that period too, didn't yeah, they? Yeah, which I I saw too when I was at yeah. Cal. We go to Warriors games. Yeah. It was like ten bucks. Yeah, cash. No, terrible. Yeah, terrible. Yeah, terrible. Um, but you know, it was a good time. Uh, it's great to see that, and it's great to see that they're going to go play. Whoever wins plays the Lakers. I know either one of these teams we wants the beat other them. to beat the Lakers. Yeah. right. We, we could take go. Let's both go down. Yeah, beat the heck out of them. So if Alex leaps to his uh, feet at any point, you'll know. I have a victory hat, so you'll <laughs> no. see. Oh, good. No spoilers. No spoilers. <laughs> also, hey, that's not as if that weren't enough. We've also got Brianna oh. Wu with us, Yay. Executive Director of Rebellion Pack. 
a game de developer, a speed runner, and yeah. now a, an advocate for Blue Sky. It's good to see. There we go. It's good to be on the show. I'm the one causing all the problems on the uh, internet that Alex has to investigate and uh, work professionally. Conquer. I I woke up today. I appreciate uh, the help, Brianna. I woke up today to a uh, post from Brianna uh, on Blue Sky saying I'm a guest on Twit today. I'm sure Blue Sky will come up. I want to convince him and his massive audience that Blue Sky is a place worth spending time. Can you help by following him and saying I'm hello? There with you, Brianna. He already, <laughs> I asked him if he needed an invite. No, no, I've been there. It's nothing. Uh, uh, wrong. You're the usual thing. All right. Wrong. What is Blue, so Brianna, explain what Blue Sky is before we go too much farther down the road. Blue Sky is Mastodon. Let's just admit it. It's Mastodon. No, it's not. I Oh, you know, and I have to say, one of the things that, yeah. that hurts me a little bit is all of this this week it was all blue sky every because i think it right. was the it was a the the blue check thing finally set off a number of well-known twitter users to the point where they said i'm out of here blue sky which was created by jack dorsey year a few years ago as a federated replacement in effect for twitter uh, attracted them, and all of a sudden, all the conversations about Blue Sky. And here I am on our little Mastodon instance. I'm a big Mastodon user and fan. I still love Mastodon, Lee. And I'm saying, oh, why? How come all of the love going to Blue Sky all of a sudden? But Blue Sky well, isn't Mastodon. Well, I think it's important to say Blue Sky is not the same. Sure, I I hear what you're saying. Um, I feel like, but the experience is very similar to it. Like the one thing that Blue Sky does better is it's not asking you to choose between nine trillion different not servers. yet servers. Not yet, but it yeah. will, won't it, Brianna? Uh, you you will have to choose eventually between like what you want your metadata data to be as far as uh, how trolls get uh, labeled and what the moderation you want is. They're basically the way they are going to offboard moderation is very similar to Mastodon, right? You're going to leave it up to individuals who go through and label like we approve this person. This is a troll. This is a harasser. This person is banned and you can subscribe to whichever one you find uh, best. So um, I think that when it comes to Blue Sky, it's a really, really, really great conversation right now. I don't think it's going to be a great conversation a year from now with the uh, approach that they're taking to moderation, in my view. They just added uh, blocking on Friday, so at least you can block somebody who's they, really annoying. They launched with no trust and safety features, no trust and safety team. Right. Uh, it was, yeah. they kind of, three people. bass backwards, right? Um, yeah. Which, in which the CEO has now admitted that she understands that what you're really getting when you buy it, buy into a social network, the product is the moderation, right? It is the community. Yep. Yes. It is not, anybody can put up a nice little white sheet that random people uh, can comment on uh, and then you consolidate all of these different tweets or skeets or whatever you want to call them. The hard part is making it a community people want to actually stick around. To. So one of the reasons it's a, a hot item right now is because it's invite only still. Yes. That's, it's just like Clubhouse in the early days. Yeah, and like, Google, Gmail in the early days. We're old enough to remember that. Yeah, yeah. that's a good way to get people wanting in. Yeah. Uh, you, no, no, you got to have an invite. Um, it also, I think, wins because it looks a lot like Twitter, right? I mean, mm -hmm. yes. Well, and it's got two things that Mastodon has intentionally kept out, which is really good search, full text search, not yeah. just based upon hashtags, and basically quote tweets, right? Yeah. If I if I press the uh, repost button, I either get a choice between repost, right? Or, which is the decision, post. like it's this religious thing among some of the founders of Mastodon of the the key developers. They they say that quote. Quote tweeting is uh, drives abuse, which is true, but it's a feature that lots mm -hmm. of people want. And they they say the same same thing about full text search, which I think is actually pretty foolish. Um, all, all is, on, is changing his mind on both. Um, yeah, uh, he's going to have to. Why not? He's going to have to because Oig, Blue Sky's okay. about to eat their lunch on. That. I got to I got to give people a crib sheet. Yep. Oigan is the creator of, of Mastodon. Mastodon does not uh, stand alone. Mastodon sits on a protocol called uh, Activity Pub. Uh, which many other apps use as well. And ActivityPub is is the backbone of something called the Fediverse, which is a federated universe of social apps, which include PixelFed, which is for pictures. Uh, there's a PeerTube, which is a, a YouTube clone. So there are a variety of things that use this ActivityPub. Blue Sky's following the same road. In fact, it was a little weird. Jack Dorsey uh, gave them, I think, $10 million a couple of years ago to start as a public benefit corporation. Mm-hmm. Not owned by Twitter. Jack is on the board. Fully but, independent. Yeah. But it's fully independent. So again, it's a public benefit corporation. And uh, his 
walking papers, his mandate was create a federated Twitter, something decentralized that no one can own. And he was kind of prescient. Right. Actually, the most interesting story about Blue Sky this week is Jack Dorsey went on Blue Sky to retract his, his statements about Elon Musk. When Elon first bought Twitter, he said the best possible person to own it. Uh, he Standing does, the light of consciousness. Yeah. Uh, that was a little... <laughs> The life consciousness did not uh, totally penetrate the yeah. in this case. He was, Jack was probably as disappointed as everybody else uh, was by Elon's stewardship and was fairly outspoken on Blue Sky uh, about that. I'll see if I can find that uh, tweet because Blue Sky does have search. So, Leo, I do want to push back a little bit. And look, I really like, I think for those of us that have been out here uh, enjoying Blue Sky, we're definitely getting a lot of pushback from Mastodon people. And I get it. I love Mastodon. I've got 15,000 uh, people there. My engagement is roughly equal to what I get on Twitter with 10 times that amount. I enjoy Mastodon. I think what you're seeing with Blue Sky is not just this ephemeral love for it because it is invite only. I think the reality is a ton of people that are just at their wits end uh, with harassment, have moved over to Blue Sky and have made it their home. And I think it doesn't take, I think there's a critical mass of journalists that can leave Twitter and make Blue Sky their home and start posting there that's going to have a really negative impact on um, you know Twitter as a, uh, a vehicle to experience news actively. But Alex, it sounds yeah. like you disagree that this is the place to go if you're being harassed on Twitter. Well, I think Blue Sky I has not been... sold on their long term vision. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, Blue Sky yeah. has been better because it is invite only. It has had a much smaller network of people on it. There hasn't yet been a lot of harassment. Right, the trolls have not been, for the most part, so Blue Sky invite codes are going for like 300 bucks on yeah. eBay. So, you know, it's a big investment to go buy an invite code and then go burn it uh, after just to get a couple of nasty uh, right. tweets at you. Right. Um, but structurally, there's nothing about Blue Sky that makes it better than Mastodon. No. Um, no. In fact, I would say, I mean, Activity Pub, there it has a longer history than AT Protocol and people have been working on it. In both cases, Mastodon and Blue Sky, people have not figured out how are you going to do moderation in a distributed fashion, right? Like the, the protocols themselves don't do a lot about the kind of metadata around moderation that is actually used inside of the big companies. And if you're a Mastodon owner right now, moderation is a big pain in the butt. And the tools do not really exist to do almost anything from an automated perspective. And so um, I, I think... Yes, it feels a little better right now. It's because the trolls have bought their blue checks on Twitter and they're running rampant on Twitter. Uh, but there's absolutely nothing that says that you won't end up with fully abusive uh, instances federating with Blue Sky, just as you've had with Mastodon. The good news on Mastodon is whoever runs the instance, and I run a Mastodon instance called twit.social, right. has kind of infinite control to moderate it. Right. You don't have the tools, but I, with a small instance like mine, it's it's about five or 6,000 people. I rely on the users to report. Mm -hmm. When they report, I review and I boot, boot them. Usually that's no more than a few a day. Uh, and it's invite only, so you have to apply to get in. And it's not invite exactly, it's but you have to apply to get in. Approved. Approval, yeah. And uh, so it hasn't been an issue. Yeah. Uh, and then we also, so, and then I also have to remind users, you can block anybody on Mastodon, which is nice. Block them on any instance anywhere. You, as a user, can block any instance. Yep. And as an administrator, I can block an instance. So if there is an instance, and there are quite a few on Mastodon that's a, that are nasty, Nazi incidents, instances, or that's hard to say, Nazi instances, uh, you can block them whole hog, which I do. Yeah. Um, and so, so right now, if you're on Twit Social, your experience is probably very benign. Probably. Yeah. Yeah, maybe not on Mastodon.social, one of the big instances. Right, but that's no, the mine, argument mine is, for federation is, is have small instances, right? That can be handled by individuals, uh, moderators, right? I'm Leo. I'm not. I don't use as long as I don't use the the instances feed. I'm on Mastodon social just because I was you know a dork and went to the first place available. Um, it's not bad at all. What's really interesting that I've noticed in, in my long experience of two days on um, Blue Sky is that black Twitter has adopted blue sky far more than Mastodon. Yep. Uh, that's and, good. I think it was a very, that, smart, I mean, that's not good for good. Mastodon, but I'm glad that they've found out that, that, that there's a home. Well, we'll see, but it was a smart thing where, um, the devs okay. valued that and they, and they found some people to give the invites to, to give the invites to the people who matter 
and and there's a lot of people there. Uh, Sadet's there. Uh, Doc Dre is there. A lot of folks are there who were not uh, on Mastodon. Uh, and Mastodon didn't give the best reception uh, when I held the Black Twitter Summit in February. Um, you know, one of the things we talked about was that the geeks of Mastodon said to Black Twitter, well, these are our rules and make your own instance. And, 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 and it was their way to say F you to a community they weren't valuing sufficiently. So we'll see what happens on Blue Sky, but it's, I, I think, a very positive sign because the, you can make, I think, a very good argument that um, the social things that work are the ones that uh, are pushed into new uses by communities like Black Twitter. If I channel the founders of Blue Sky, and I'll let you respond to this, Alex, they said, well, we've got to solve the issues of uh, distributed ID. We've got to solve these issues of federation before we start putting in moderation tools, before we start putting in blocking. Because, of course, if you don't have a solid framework for federation, then you don't even know what blocking means. Is right. blocking local? Is blocking federated? How do you what federate it? Yeah. And so one of the things they, they have done that is, I think, probably better their protocol is called at proto uh one of the things they have done better is it's it's very easily portable your identity on blue sky uh mine's leo laporte.me it doesn't say blue sky and i can easily move that because it's a it's a public key crypto mm. uh, backed did to another instance if I don't like an instance. So I think that it, that, you know, you messed on, you can move, but it's a manual process. It's right. not it's a, a real pain. And you, you need the server to do the work for you. That's right. right. Yeah. And that's a big issue because if right. the server goes dark. Right. Which is, there's been a bunch, yeah. which I think both blue sky, all of these federated platforms are going to end up in, in really serious moderation politics, right? That you see, if you look at admin block or feta block, hashtags in Macedon, it is full of people turning their little personal fights into folks, into blocking entire instances, and then mm -hmm. hundreds mm -hmm. or thousands of people complaining, why can't I follow yep. my friends anymore? Because these two people, and then also well-meaning people who, who are trying to run communities that are open and helpful uh, and that don't have the kind of abuse you see on Twitter are being driven away from hosting Mastodon because of the, the abuse they get if they, if they slightly deviate from right. the conventional wisdom of what, of what you know, people want or the most maximal kind of. Uh, so, how would you architect it, Alex? And we should I, say, Alex yeah. has trust in Stacey's standings. You've done, yeah, yeah, you've yeah, done this that's before. Why I'm you are you are the guy. If anybody well, can talk about it, yeah, I mean, I, you would not know, but you know, I'm actually 22 years old. This is just <laughs> <what you> <laughs> I um I, I I wouldn't call myself. Like, I've I've done a lot of trust and safety work. I'm teaching a trust and safety class at Stanford right now. I kind of wish the Blue Sky folks had taken my class because this is exactly why I teach mm -hmm, a class at Stanford. Mm -hmm. Is you should not be launching any kind of social product without having done a lot of the basic stuff. It just feels Blue Sky, they've launched, they're probably, I think they've launched six months early based upon yep. what's going That's on. That's the feeling I get as well. This is so early, but have they launched it still invite only? Yeah, well, I, yeah. It would I, be better be a little under the radar for a little longer. Well, well, what happened is the invite only wasn't working. The reason all this abuse came up is the initial invites didn't have enough entropy. Uh, and so you had, and it looks like there's no rate limiting on the API. Uh, so you had trolls just brute forcing the invites uh, and then w walking themselves in. So they didn't have to really burn anything of consequence to go abuse people. So, yes, I, I think there's a, a number of interesting security and, and safety issues in Blue Sky. But in the long run, even if they build out a team, how do you do community management of rules in a federated world is going to be a fascinating problem. I also think we're going to need better tools for folks because um, our team's doing a bunch of work on this. I, I don't want to preview it too much, but we'll be publishing a paper probably in two, three weeks from now where we talk about child safety issues on Mastodon. And it's a really serious issue. Oh, it's a serious issue that, Alex, has, yeah. that you have to think about if you're a, a Mastodon you, uh, owner, yeah. because when your people subscribe to other folks' content, that content gets pulled down and stored on your server. Yeah, we right? should explain how this uh, works. So here's my Mastodon instance. There's a number of timelines. There's the local timeline, which is just people posting on Twitch social. There's the people I follow, kind of like your normal Twitter timeline. But there's this federated timeline. This is a timeline of everybody followed by anybody on my server, yeah. which means if somebody on my server follows and it's uh, somebody that has child porn that is now on my server. Right, it gets fetched by your server and stored in your blob storage. Which means I'm responsible. Which you're for responsible it. for. And and you don't have the tools that Twitter has that Facebook has and such to go automatically check that image against known hash lists and such. Right. So it, that's it's a solvable problem, but 
the there's so much thinking about the fun parts and not a lot of people are, are spending a lot of time on well, the this is side. this is silicon valley writ large yeah. right i mean we it's you know move fast and break things and you know this comes up a lot in the crypto field as well which is if they just consulted crypto experts they wouldn't have done it this way if they just consulted trust and safety experts they wouldn't have done well, they this would this never way. would have launched i mean this but is the, the flip side the problem. Should, it would never launch and safety yeah. people is we don't want you to do anything you're like lawyers if you, if lawyers ran the world nothing would ever <laughs> happen <Ouch>. wow <laughs> that's brutal that's okay brutal. you're not that bad shots fired <laughs> yeah but <clears throat> If I could just uh, chime in on here for a second, I yes. really want to back up what you're saying, Alex. And I think that is the fundamental flaw that I see with Blue Sky because their vision of the future is someone who does not have any resources behind them from Blue Sky. Someone apparently is going to go out there. They're going to be writing all this metadata that you or I or some user can subscribe to, to basically put a label on users and put a label on activity, like put a label on skeets, right? This is not funded. And I was talking, um, you know, I was talking to the former head of uh, Twitter uh, uh, Trust and Safety about this yesterday on, on Blue Sky, where, you know, this is incredibly expensive work to do correctly. This is the entire reason Elon Musk has like automated a lot of this because it is so expensive to do trust and safety well. You do have to have oversight. You have to have transparency. You have to have the ability to appeal. Right. Um, so this is the part of it that I am deeply, deeply, deeply skeptical with Blue Sky. I mean, I suppose theoretically that you get enough users over there, enough of the, you know, major users of Twitter and someone comes along and they offer to do trust and safety as a product that I can subscribe to for eight dollars a month. Um, maybe that works. Like I could kind of see that working, but it's just their, their entire paradigm here, in my view, is solving the wrong problem. What I do think they've done right is they've gotten all the right people from Twitter, off Twitter, talking to each other on this service, enjoying what it's like to have a conversation without endless harassment and death threats with adults there. And we're really getting emotionally invested in it. So, you know, maybe they can turn the ship around, but I share Alex's appraisal that this is work that should have been done, you know, six months ago and really ideally prior to the MVP. I didn't, I saw a threat I didn't plan it this way, but I have somehow put together the perfect panel for this for this topic. Brianna Wu, one of the victims of Gamergate uh, and of still a very, despite that, very active Twitter user. Uh, Alex, who's obviously the, the guy to talk to for trust and safety. Jeff is also very active. Uh, in Twitter has reached out to various Twitter communities. You just did a seminar for school on uh, on Black Twitter. Um, so this boy, I couldn't have put together. Now, I didn't know Blue Sky was going to be the topic of the day, but it sure ended up being the perfect panel to I discuss. A lot of this. invites went out. I saw I to, to both Brianna and Alex's point. I before we got on, and I lost it. There was a what are we going to call it, a thread, a skeet thread, a I don't know a <laughs> do they spread? Do they have threads? A, a, spread. a scred. Uh, okay, I like scred. spread. We're going to go with spread. Uh, I saw I saw a scred saying that, that and I'm sure Alex, you're a little a lot more about this than I will. The, the intelligence on some of the bad places where the bad people go, uh, they're you know arming on the border of Crimea here at Blue Sky, planning to come in and to attack trans people. Yeah, and when they come in. They're going to have search to be able to do that. They're going to have quote tweets to be able to do that. And they're, and the blocking is going to be fairly limited. And so how, with no staff, how does Blue Sky react? And, and very importantly, how does the community of Blue Sky react? How do we, well, who do we, who do we report to? What do we do? What happens when we see it happening? Um, it's going to be a very crucial moment that uh, I, I'm rooting for Blue Sky, but I'm worried for them at this moment. Yeah. 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 Well, in, the problem they have versus Mastodon is the the AT network right now is ninety nine percent one company, right? So you know that and a kind handful of, of people. It's right. not even a big company, right? And so that kind of attack has happened multiple times in the Fediverse, but the responsibility for dealing with it is distributed across. It, you know, Mastodon and Social is the biggest, but not anywhere near ninety nine percent of the user base. Right. Um, and right. so I, I do think they're cruising for a bruising. Uh, they're going to have to hire some folks pretty fast. Fortunately for them, it, unfortunately, Google and Facebook and a bunch of other companies have been hire, 
have been firing really good trust and safety people. Yeah. Um, Twitter <laughs> it's is a good firing time really to be good. Hiring. So it, it is a great time to build a trust and safety team. Um, <laughs> folks you who you could never have hired out of these companies before because they would have been way too expensive are, are totally available now. Message Alex at cybervillains.com. <laughs> no, 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 it on. I'm not He's got some records. No, but you've got, I'm sure you know some <laughs> well, names. Yeah. I'm sure you Yoel can help. Roth is, but you all who came to my, my Black Twitter Summit, He's been talking since then, and others have been talking about the need to create these structures for Mastodon and ActivityPub. Yeah. But now there's going to be pulling in both directions because I think there's going to be an urgent need for Blue Sky as well. Let me step back as a user. Uh, so I'm watching all this with, with interest, but it, but kind of, I guess, because I run a Mastodon instance, I'm not, I do have a little dog in this hunt. But as a user, looking at the culture, looking at the content and so forth, let me ask, is it over for Twitter, first of all, or is Twitter worth trying to save? Uh, oh. I mean, we're, we're acting as if, oh, yeah, <laughs> what Twitter's done. What's next? But is it over? I I think that I, I actually do. I think it, what's the quote where you go bankrupt uh, slowly and then quickly? I, I do think that's Twitter's fate. I mean, you know, under Elon Musk, I, I, I don't think I'm the only person that has this experience. Twitter is... A remarkably bad place to spend time and i was there for gamergate y'all so <laughs> it's gotten worse right so it's like worse now every than it was. every tuesday is like gamergate now right <laughs> I, really, it's is so bad you know the the thing is you can't tell anyone who's real in every single conversation you've got a bunch of crypto jerk stores warming their way in there Harassment is crazy. You know, death threats, rape threats. Uh, they're just so not even. So here's the argument people would thing. use it, well, that I've heard people use. Finish, this. Well, don't ever look that. at the for you tab. Just following, just for the people you follow. That's not full of it. It doesn't solve. It that. doesn't help because they rise to the top of your mentions. Like even when I'm looking through my individual users, it's all the blue checks that are there. So yeah, I stopped I looking at replies about ten years ago, though. So. I mean, fair enough. That's but a problem. My point is, I think that Elon made a really fatal mistake here with decertifying all the journalists. The only value that Twitter has in my mind is it is the best place to talk about crazy events as they're happening, like the Will Smith slap, right? right? So if you have a place with a critical mass of those journalists to talk about this stuff, that is something Blue Sky can definitely become the home of. So Twitter doesn't have to get all the like Twitter doesn't have to hemorrhage all their users. They just have to hemorrhage the most important power yeah. users. And, and tons I of journalists are already on Blue Sky. Well, okay. So wait a minute. You've yeah. conflated two different things. So one of the reasons Twitter was good is so that you could see the what people were saying about the slap, not just journalists. You yes. could see what the zeitgeist was, what people were yes. saying. Then, so that's one thing. Then there's also the the uh, important important voices, the 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 I don't know what the va verified voices. That's another thing. Uh, people aren't leaving Twitter, or are they? Mm -hmm. Some verified voices have. I mean, that's what happened this week in Blue Sky. Was yeah. a lot of well known people said, "That's it, I'm done." Right. If 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 all of the, but I also noticed AOC, Alexandria uh, Ocasio Cortez, the member of Congress from New York, was on Blue Sky, but she said, "But this is my personal account because I can't move my account as AOC Rep AOC over yet, my government account over yet. It's still on Twitter mm -hmm. because it hasn't. I don't know. So it hasn't been a." Proved there's some sort of process. Well, uh, she was saying, I mean, one of the problems is there's not basic security stuff on Blue Sky, right? So it doesn't yeah. have multi-factor authentication. There's no two-factor. Yeah. It doesn't have verification itself. So the the problem that Twitter has created for themselves, the problem that Blue Sky and Mastodon are facing. They just is, embraced it. <laughs> right. From a, from a historical perspective, Twitter had the best understood, the most recognized brand value in the blue check mark of what it meant to be verified. And they threw that away. They yeah. burned all of that brand value. They burned it down to the ground. At the moment, worse, that, worse, Alex. It became a negative. Right, it became it's, a negative. It, yes, I say it's, the, it's the mark of the eight buck schmuck. If you have the blue check, <laughs> it's not just meaningless. It says that you're an idiot. It says you're an idiot, or or you're a faker. And yeah. at, we're at a historical moment. We're we're about we're entering a time in which any kind of thing that human beings can generate, text, video, audio. All of that stuff is now easily fakeable using large language models. Oh, yeah, yeah. And um, as a result, like from a 
to throw away identity as something that you can use as trustworthy in your platform at the moment that it has actually become economical to run really tens of thousands of accounts that look like they're legitimately human is incredibly stupid. And I think this is going to be the story over the next two years or so is what platform is going to be able to give you trust in the identity of the people yep. who, are, who are joining, as well as the possibility that they're not, there's the positive identity. Is this Leo Laporte who's saying this? And there's also kind of the negative identity of, well, if I'm talking to somebody, is it, unlikely that they're part of a botnet of 10,000, 20,000, 50,000 fake accounts that are being driven out of St. Petersburg or Tehran or, uh, you know, Saudi Arabia or a variety of other places that love to manipulate the internet. And that's what's gone away at Twitter, partially because of the blue check thing, partially because all of the people who do anti-influence operation stuff have either been fired or quit. Um, and so I think one of the things Brianna is talking about here is you do not know when you're interacting with people whether or not they're part of massive manipulatory okay. frame, uh, networks. Now. But you all know about that. But I would submit that the average user doesn't neither knows nor cares. Well, they don't know whether it's fake or not. I mean, they're not they don't following care. The, the literature on what the no. Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps is doing on Twitter. Right. But what they do feel is that if they make a political statement that is disagreeable by somebody, they will end up with 500 people sending them what looks like death threats or calling them a schmuck. That's pretty bad. Right. And, and that that experience that everybody is now having the Gamergate uh, experience. Everybody on gets it. Yeah, makes the the value of the platform go. But so maybe you don't say anything that's ch that's political and just talk about the Warriors game. Yes. And right. then it's okay, right? Is it good for something like that? You want to talk about the Kings Warriors? Is it a good place for something not, like that's that? That's not what people are on Twitter on, right? I mean, that's that's the Pinterest model, right? It's like this is a fun place where people don't have serious conversation. But Twitter was a place for serious political conversation. Yeah, that's out. And 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 it's not useful. Clearly that's out, right? Yes, that's gone. Uh, can you go there to get news? Not trustworthy news, right? Like Again, though, I think most people don't know whether it's trustworthy or not, right? Yeah. I think most people aren't aware of that. Yeah, I... Which is a problem for the polity, obviously. I think it's a problem. I, I, 2024 is going to be a disaster. The election year. It is going to be by far worse than 2016 in that only- Because all the troll farms are going to be out in force. Troll farms are out in force. They're going to have large language models behind them, not the ones that are being hosted at Google or- No, but that Google automates the their process, locally. right? So they yes. can create a ma a, a, an onslaught. They an have an army onslaught. now. Yes. And Twitter has completely given up on preventing these kinds of- of botnets, right? Um, you, or it's encouraging. Or it's encouraging them. It, it, for eight bucks, you can verify all these accounts and get yourself raised up. That is totally economically viable for the professionals who manipulate social For media. Russia or China. For Russia, China, or, or domestic groups who are renting out their cap this capability. It's not clear it's illegal for an American politician to hire a, a local troll farm to go troll their opponents. OMG, it's not, huh? It's, are there, you, you probably know, can't use campaign funds for it, but it, it's an interesting question. <laughs> can you use PAC funds? One of the things that... Uh, uh -oh. one of the, That's a good question. Yeah. Yeah. Can you use like PAC funds? Question. You know, that might... Uh, uh. So, uh, <laughs> who, one, who do we know? <laughs> well, uh, I lost the, the train of thought. One of the things, um, that became an, uh, an issue, uh, on uh, Twitter. Uh, well, so is Elon just going to run it into the ground? And I mean, he's got to be close to bankruptcy at this point already. Right. Right. So have we, can we just grieve Twitter and move on? Is that what we should do? Well, I, I, Right now, I mean, Twitter isn't the best position company to take advantage of the. He could the, just switch it all back on. So one option well, is he could just give. I mean, I don't think as long as he's running it, it the people are going to come back. Right. But if he said right. sold it for a humongous loss, or if he let it go into receivership and it's being run by the banks to which it owns oh, money, That's I think Twitter about. could turn it all around. Right, rehire the trust and safety team, get Yoel Rath yep. back in. They've got all the software that they had before. Right. He, you know, Mike Masnick mocks Elon saying he's speed running the moderation curve and doing a bad job yeah. of it. But you can rewind it. Right. You could. And, you could and put it Twitter all had over 16 years kind of a refined. They'd certainly gone through this long enough that they had a pretty refined. You think their system was good enough? It, it was it was rough. I mean, it. Twitter, Mark Zuckerberg's, you know, a clown car that drove into a gold mine uh, certainly <laughs> isn't like an accurate description of Twitter. And from trust and safety direction, Twitter had like some of the best people, but they were never well resourced compared to YouTube and, and Facebook and other companies like that. Yeah. yeah.
So let's talk like pragmatically. Like Alex, uh, let's take a break and then we're going to talk okay. pragmatically. I love this. This is a great conversation. I'm sorry if you have no interest in this, but honestly, uh, the future of social is kind of hanging by a thread at this point. A lot of people, all the issues. A lot of yeah. people have said social's over. You know, like it's over. It's just uh, forget about it. I I hate to give it up because it's been a valuable way to communicate, to have people be heard. Uh, but we, if we can't solve these trust and safety issues, if we can't solve the troll farm issues, maybe it is over. Maybe it's too potent a weapon. Yeah, it'd for, be very sad for for if we go back to you have to own a television station or a newspaper. Yeah, we don't want to go heard. back to that. Yeah. Only I the television station owners and the newspaper publishers want that. They love that idea. Yeah, they do. Like yeah. That, yeah. Uh, what about podcast network owners? What about them? Nobody ever mentions. <laughs> <laughs> big podcast. Think big. It's going to be big someday. I promise you. Uh, well, great panel for this. Uh, Brianna Wu, it's wonderful to see you. Wonderful to have you back. Rebellionpack.com. Where that is your uh, Frank Wu uh, memorial mug. I love it. It's beautiful. You 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 married him for his mug. I married him just for this mug right here. That is a that great mug. I love friend. that. 15 years, but it was worth <laughs> She got the mug. <laughs> <laughs> Say hi to Frank, will you? I think I will. are I will. some We're of those illustrations are they no they are they woos? No, that's all Capcom uh, CPS2 art, but we're going to be out there for a live show in a month, so maybe we can all go get dinner. For a live twist? And Frank. Fantastic. Yeah. Can't wait. Uh, great to have Alex Stamos in studio. We don't see people in the studio very often. I'll try not to breathe on you, Alex. Uh, Alex uh, works with Chris Krebs, the legendary. Two great names uh, with the uh, Krebs Stamos uh, group. Yeah. Uh, what do you do at the Krebs Stamos group? Uh, we work with companies to help them deal with their big picture cyber risk, mostly geopolitical cyber risk. So, so again, I couldn't have put together a better yeah. panel for this dang show completely un inadvertently. And Jeff Jarvis, I think you all know him from buzzmachine.com and his new I'm book. At the grown ups table today. I'm always yeah. when that happens. You see him, of course, uh, every Wednesday on, uh, the, uh, uh, what is that show? Twig. That it's called Twig. Twig. This week in... Uh, Twig, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Soon you forget. <laughs> <laughs> He's also the author of the Gutenberg Parenthesis, and we're getting closer and closer to the uh, release. June. Yes, June. But you can order it now for discounts. Let's At go I'm giving you a chance to plug it. Gutenberg Parenthesis dot Parenthesis dot com. It's hard to spell. I got it. <laughs> There's a lot of letters. The Age of Print and its Lessons for the Age of Internet. It couldn't be better. All three of you. It's wonderful. Bloomsbury, by the way, publishes this. And uh, is that is that deal, the Barnes & Noble deal, still good? No, it was to Friday. Oh, shoot. But you, but you get a discount on Bloomsbury. Also, my favorite for, for uh, Blackwells in the UK, I love, because I can buy English, British books and American books at a discount with free shipping. To the and US. Of course, we'll yeah. put up a link to indie books as well. Yeah, let's give them all a put. We want to keep those independent bookstores alive. Good to have all three of you here. You know who else I'd like to keep alive? The United States Postal Service, friends. <laughs> 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 you always, you never know what's going to happen to the USPS, but gosh darn it, it's an important part of democracy. Ben Franklin started it, and it's still going. But I got to tell you one thing. You do not have to actually go to the post office to get the services of the U.S. Postal Service. In fact, here at Twit for the last, I don't know, 15 years, we've been using stamps.com. For the last 25 years, Stamps.com has been helping businesses save time and money because with Stamps.com, you can print real U.S. postage from your computer with your printer, no postage meter necessary. You can even, you know, tell Stamps.com, have them come and get it, and the uniformed employee of the federal government will come and pick up your package and send it on its way. You could focus on your business because Stamps.com has your postage needs covered. Plus, you get discounts you can't get at the post office. Great rates, too. They've been a partner uh, here. We, they've been advertising on our shows since 2012. That's 11 years now. I got to ask, if you haven't tried them yet, what are you waiting for? Oh, I know. How about if I make Sweeten the Pot? Because now Stamps.com also works with UPS. Yes. So now, really, all your shipping needs are handled. Stamps.com has huge carrier discounts, up to 84% off U.S. Postal Service and UPS rates. They've negotiated a very sweet deal with UPS. It'll save you a lot of money. And again, 
You use your computer, print those labels. They'll even send you a free scale so you get exactly the right. You don't pay one penny more for shipping than you need to. They'll suggest if you, you know, you put a book on there, they'll say, you know, have you thought about media rates? They'll suggest better rates. It's so great. And if you sell products online, it is the most professional way. If you're an Etsy or eBay or Amazon seller, it seamlessly connects with every major marketplace and shopping cart. So it automatically, you don't, no typos because it's going to take that address directly from the site. Your return address is automatically filled in your logo too. If you want to look so professional, you always have exactly the right cost. I can't tell you how many times I've gotten packages from Etsy, brown paper, twine, licked stamps that placed on the package. And, and it's not unusual for it to be postage due. See, that's a bad impression. Do it right with stamps.com. They automatically tell you your best, cheapest, fastest shipping options. You save money. For 25 years now, stamps.com has been indispensable for over 1 million businesses, including ours. You get access to the postal service. You get access to UPS. No lines, no traffic, no waiting any time of the day or night. Set your business up for success. Get started with stamps.com. We have a really great offer for you. Use the promo code TWIT, the special offer, the TWIT offer. Just click the link up in the right, the microphone, enter TWIT. You get four weeks, a four-week trial. You get free postage to use over a period of time. And that digital scale, no long-term commitments, no contracts, stamps.com. Just click that microphone at the top of the page. Remember the offer code TWIT, though. That's very important, so they know you saw it here. Thank you, Stamps, for supporting TWIT. Thank you for supporting TWIT. Stamps.com. All right, I... I, I didn't say put a pin in it, but I probably should have, Brianna, because I, I interrupted you. We were talking. No worries. And we and, and this is, man. there Capitalism. couldn't be a better time to talk about the future of Twitter, the alternatives to Twitter, uh, and there couldn't be a better panel to do this. So continue with your thought. So I, I would love to get some consensus from everyone here. Like, uh, I think we all agree that Blue Sky has a better chance to make it than most social media networks. Like, I think if you want to run the numbers, it's probably safest to bet on failure for all of these. <laughs> but, it, but I think they have a better chance than average. So if they did want to win in the long run, Alex, I'd really love to know your opinion here. This is what I think they need to do. Um, I know they want to do the Mastodon thing where like you add some metadata to your server and like verify yourself that way. I think this is a losing idea. I think they should just commit to like um, identifying and manually reviewing and re-verifying everybody that was formally verified at Twitter. I think especially Ooh. going into an election, I think that would be a huge draw for all of those users. And I think it would very much be worth the money because the users you want are the power users. I saw one study that said it was like one one hundredth of a hundredth of the Twitter users that generated like 90 percent of the content. We are the nut jobs that are on there. That's right. Hours of the day. They want us over there. Right. So I think that's the first thing. The second thing is, look, I understand that Jack and like, you know, Jay and the crypto people, they've got this idea for like a, a federated, um, you you know, um, like modular idea to um, harassment and uh, trust and safety. If they're going to stick with that, I think at the very least, they need to invest in a very strong default option that they themselves are funding. If you have a problem with the way they run it, I think you should be able to. So like a main site, else's. a main, right. like main mastodon.social or a main blue sky Correct. dot app, that kind Correct. of thing. With their own moderation policies. That's going to happen things. anyway, create, right? That's what yeah, happened at Mastodon. Exactly. Yeah. So create a baseline, like really go out there, add the transparency that really ended up biting Twitter in the butt, um, but really commit to but that. But does that solve anything? Sure. I think if anything we've learned, uh, I hope we've learned that, you know, I look at T2 and a bunch of other Twitter clones. We don't want to go with a centralized site anymore, right? A single owner centralized site. Or is that easier and better for trust and safety? Nobody has figured out a good way to do a truly distributed trust and safety. I mean, the best example would be email, right? Email is truly federated. And uh, the way that works is you, re plot, you rely upon whoever holds your mailbox to effectively do the trust and safety work, spam filtering, filtering out anything horrible that happens. That being said, you know, uh, Brianna knows this as, as much better than I do. If you're at all in the public Oh, we get, we get horribly, we all get horribly harassed via right. You email. get horrible harassment on email. Yeah. But and you can ignore it. 
and you can ignore it, but that, you can make that same statement around social. Right? The difference is that nasty poison pen letter that comes to me is not public. Right. Somebody does that on Twitter, it's public. All right. That's a good point. And that that does bring in lots of other people. I, I think Brianna's plan is good. I, I think one, B Sky is going to have to have the, the main kind of B Sky dot app. It, they're going to have to do trust and safety. They cannot wash their hands and say we're distributed and it's not our, our responsibility. And second, you somebody's going to have to step in and do verification. Verification is expensive, right? So to to take photographs of people's IDs and to say this account belongs to this in real life person, either you have to pay a decent amount of money. And I think it's like something like three to $4 per account that you're trying to get verified through a service, or you have to build that in house or buy it. When I was at Facebook, we bought a company that did ML verification of identifiers. Um, and that was like, I think a $400 million or something purchase in that, in that range. Right. So somebody's going to have to do that. And, but I think people who do that are going to be in a good place uh, for the next couple what of years. What about the way Mastodon does verification where it's kind of the burden is on the user you know, I've verified my, uh, a few, of, if you go to my profile on Mastodon, you could see the green highlight says, well, he owns Twit, he owns Leo.fm, and I'm using Keyoxide to verify the other sites. I, That's one way of doing it, right? That's distributed. There's no burden on the Mastodon I think like almost owner. just like every other product feature of Mastodon, it works great for nerds, right? <laughs> yeah. But like yeah. It, yeah. it is yeah. not That's a feature exactly that I think it. is realistic. I, the, the nerdy solution. You're talking to the king of nerds here, but yes. <laughs> yeah. I thought it was really easy. Yeah, it's pretty easy for you, but like realistically, I mean, how many people are going to be able to verify? Here's to the here's my well known domain. That well, as an example, Washington Post has been trying to deal with how do I verify our journalists? Yes. using rel.me, and it's you know it's not obvious, it's complicated, and yeah, Keybase had like a really cool. I loved back Keybase. In the day. That's why um, I'm on Keyoxide. Is I miss Keybase. Yeah, and so it, if. I think there is a product opportunity here for one of these companies to do a Keybase level strength of. Uh, Verification. Keybase is still around. You hired away. You hired away I most helped, of the Keybase it, people at Zoom. It was my my it's your fault. fault. I, I helped uh, Zoom buy Keybase. <laughs> You're right. The, the Keybase service is still running. Effectively, they run it as a charity. Um, I, it would be a cool thing for Zoom to do to like donate the source code. I think that would be a neat yeah. thing for them to do because then somebody else, maybe Apache or you know Mozilla or somebody else, could pick up that that code and, and use it. Needs to be somebody we so trust. It's got to be something you trust. I mean, the whole idea it's of- It's like a, the certificate authorities, and that has had its own problems right. as well, right? Right, but the idea of a key-based-like system is that the level of trust you have in that intermediary is limited. It is not infinite. With the certificate authorities, it is close to infinite yeah. uh, based upon how it works right now. Yeah. Right, right, right. Leo, can I, can I add into Brianna's challenge here? By the way, key-based um, is at least as geeky as rel.me. I yeah. mean, it's worse. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not saying it's, it's, it's a usable solution right now. You might as well do no but, but Somebody could make up something. Right. That would be easy to do, that would somehow verify your identity. It's would not, you have no, to no, submit no, no. documents? It's, because it's, I have so to say, it, that's a showstopper for some people as well. It it I is. don't want to send anybody my for the, for the vulnerable driver's yeah. license. Right. It yeah. is. And that is the flip side here, right? Like, it, you can have, an, you can have an, a verification of a pseudo identity of this is the real drill, right? right? That doesn't have to be. But with the breaking up of Twitter, a lot of that's gone away. That, that's, that's a what shame. Twitter's that is a real loss, actually. Yes. Uh, yeah. Neil Stevenson talked about that in his book, Fall. He had a similar system because he realized people were going to want to have multiple identities. No one should have to have, I shouldn't just have to be Leo Laporte. I could be a Dev Null as well and other characters. And it would be verified and the root cert would be Leo Laporte. Mm -hmm. But maybe it would be anonymous so that I could have some anonym, anonymous. But it would somehow verify out there. And then we need something like that. That's Sure. I mean, yes, you could build like some kind of incredibly complex system like that. <laughs> It's easier if you're but a science is, fiction author. This is you where just, Blue Sky has an opportunity over Mastodon is because Blue Sky is mostly uh, in-house right now. It is not really federated. Does they the DID help with that, the distributed identity? Uh, it might. I have to look into it more. Yeah. I, I would ask Brianna because I think she spent a lot more time looking at this. The, the, two, the two things of the AT protocol that really distinguish it are this uh, decentralized database but it is a common form, unlike Mastodon, where it's some sort of message passing thing. There is a standard for how your data is stored. And then this distributed identity, which is across all instances. Have you looked into AT Proto, Brianna? Uh, I have not. I have oh, okay. not. Um, another goal, one of the downsides with the way that they're doing it is you have to, uh, basically your block list becomes public. There's a whole lot of information that becomes public just by the nature of how they're doing right. it. So they're right. they're committed to full transparency. I did want to hear from Jeff, though. Uh, I know you had some Thank thoughts you. about that. Yeah. 
Well, I, I, I like your your view of just wholesale take the Twitter verifications as a starter kit. I think that's yeah. brilliant. But that's lost. Um, We've lost I, that. I, now, I, well, we? well, no, no, because they know people. There, there were services that. Well, yeah, you you bought the um, the plaque, Leo, that said you, I have a plaque. Verified. I have a plaque. Uh, some, yes, some verified. Right, that right. So that's point one. <laughs> point two is that I think we might have to enter into capitalism here. Um, and, and, and what I see is a WordPress like model. And this is where I think Jack was headed that the base unit of either activity pub or AT as protocols are open because they're protocols, but then there are commercial entities on top. And this is where it goes to what Alex was saying that I can pay someone for a moderation service. I can pay someone for a verification service. I can pay for the Disney fied view of, of the web or whatever that, that I think we're going to have, like WordPress.com, a top WordPress.org, I think we're going to have to see investment in here because Blue Sky does not have the money right now to build a trust and safety team like Twitter had. Yeah. It just, just, it's not there. So how do we get, and neither does Mastodon. So how do we get the investment in there? I think we've got to find ways to bring in some commercial entities. Now, is that ad supported? We get back into that whole mess of attention-based economies and all that crap. Is it... Uh, paid for by users, and then it's a matter of privilege. That's a problem too. And by the way, one other thing that came out at, at the Black Twitter Summit, Leo, to your point a minute ago, what, with verification, was that we had a couple of sex workers there who are the leading edge of harassment online by officialdom and the world, and they don't want their names verified. Right. They don't want their names out there for very good reason. And, and so you've got to have ways, I think, as Alex said, where you can verify an identity that isn't a, an official identity, uh, a government identity. And that's yeah. important as well. We, it's ironic because we need it now more than ever. Yeah. You know, and it's also hard. Twitter to, blue. Yeah. Now more than ever. Now more than ever. <laughs> Gosh darn it. Elon, if you're listening, it's, oh. a, it's an opportunity. But now. back to... Maybe we could get some people together to buy, to buy Twitter away. from back, you know, yeah. get a couple of billionaires. Because they've got all that data still. They could just turn back. They haven't thrown it out. They haven't thrown it away. They could federate tomorrow. Right. They could, they could re-verify all the people who have, they've actually looked at IDs and create a new color. You can let Twitter blue people keep their blue check mark and you go upgrade to the gold or whatever you want to call it. Um, but Musk would have to admit that he was wrong. And, and that does not seem something that he does too often. Unless they go bankrupt. Um, the, who are because because if it goes bankrupt, the bankers get it, not the, the shareholders. Right. Who are the do you know who are the bank holders, the 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 the, the, the uh, debt holders? Well, there's the Saudi uh, <laughs> the Saudi that is. sovereign fund, which right. is a uh, is a significant stake. I don't know where their uh, where their allegiances lie. <laughs> yeah, we have to look up. I I don't know if it's public. Uh, what you know what would happen? Uh, and who would who. Who's like the, the who'd have control? There. Yeah, who would have control? But yeah, I mean, you could see it going. I mean, that's one of his ways out. Is he can just miss a payment or two? I'm not sure how many Ooh. payments he has to miss before they're able to effectively foreclose. Yeah. Um, allow the company to go into receivership in those banks, and the banks hire a professional manager. What does that do to his Tesla stock? Since so much of that is intertwined now. Well, it's probably you know? better for a Tesla stock in that. If he wants Twitter to continue to exist now, he has to sell Tesla stock to take that cash and pour it into Twitter to pay uh -huh. off the banks, uh -huh. right? Um, and so I expect that Tesla sh shareholders would be happy to see him to stopping to burn his reputation in this way um, and, and to reduce the chance that he's going to have to do future sales. So Larry Ellison has a billion. <laughs> Cotter Holding, which is the Qatar's uh, sovereign wealth fund, uh, of course, Prince Alawid bin Talal, uh, he has 35 million uh, shares, kept his shares. 13 billion from bank loans, including Morgan Stanley, B of well, A. Shares, I'm not asking about shares. I'm asking about debt holders. Debt holders. Morgan bankrupt. Stanley, B of A, debt. Mitsubishi, UFJ Financial Group, Mizuho, Barclays, and uh, two French banks, BNP Paribas and Societe Generale. Um, Morgan Stanley, three and a half billion. So Morgan Stanley, probably the largest debtor. So if they have, if they have sanity and they come in and they hire... Alex and they hire some other smart people. I would uh, say just could, hire this panel. Resurrect. Just hire this panel. You'd be set. Well, and you end up with Twitter for the cost of thirteen billion, not forty five billion. And so it's a much better deal. I don't think it's worth thirteen now either, but it's more closer to thirteen than forty five. Yeah. Would you so okay, so the the lenders have first dibs. So you would just write off 
Uh, I think if go into bankruptcy, there'd be a reshuffling, and the shareholders would probably they'd get, lose. The shareholders lose. Would lose yeah. all their equity. Jack Jack himself loses a billion bucks. Yeah, he left it there. Yeah, uh, and the banks get control. I'm, <laughs> we're planning the demise of Twitter. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, it seems unlikely. I mean, Elon's still the richest guy in the world. He probably can as I, I think figure he, it I out. Mean, the numbers people have shown is that he can effectively run it indefinitely, yeah. depending on exactly what happens at his at his cost. He just doesn't want it to. Yes. Be out of his right. Brianna, could you imagine trusting Twitter again? Could you imagine it being fixed? Under Elon Musk, no. No, I, I know that. No, that's stipulated, Your Honor. <laughs> so uh, could there be a future version of Twitter that fixed these mistakes? I suppose. I think that's theoretically possible. Yeah. So it, where, where where would you put your bets now? Because I've heard you go back and forth a little bit here. Between Mastodon sure. slash Activity Pub, Blue Sky, and Twitter. Sure. Who has the best shot? In so the next two years. I, I just want to be honest. And I know, look, I enjoy Mastodon a lot. I, 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 Leo, if you get me an invite, I'm happy to change my instance over to Twit. I would love to do that. I've really enjoyed it. I don't think there's a feature where normal people sign up for Mastodon. I just don't think that's going to happen. Uh, would it help I don't. if I showed you this plaque <laughs> yes. that said that I am who I say I am? Because I have a plaque yeah. to prove it. This well, Screenshot this go. and make that your yes, that should be your banner on every platform should be. now you're verified how I much think, did the plaque think, cost you leo it was like 40 bucks but it was worth uh, every yeah. penny of it <laughs> so it says I in honor of leo laporte who had a verified twitter account before they were available for purchase november 2022 <laughs> i love that <laughs> I just took a video of my, uh, my thing. So that's the whole thing. So I think Master and I was going to continue to be have a uh, an outsized um, impact in geek culture. Um, but I think that you're going to run up against like Discord. Just being honest, like I talk to more people on Discord on a daily basis than I do on Mastodon. And uh, I actually, I do too. Run up against. We it. have our yeah. own Discord server as well, but I do too. So, so I, I don't think Mastodon is going to win. I do think it's going to get a percentage of it. And I think Blue Sky has a lot of things like up against it. I think it's got a better shot than most of these social media networks. But um, I, I think like the, the reality is Twitter is going to keep limping along in this broken state until like people settle on going somewhere else. I mean, I just don't think this is tenable. I'm not the only person on this panel that finds it a almost useless place to spend time in this forum. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. it's going to continue to exist. It is going to become the most important 8chan copy yeah. of the 2024 election. Exactly. <laughs> it, is becoming, it is becoming a troll site. Um, and what you'll see is because the blue check marks, inevitably you have this cycle of you pay for the eight bucks, you get much better algorithmic reach. You get a lot more push that, that that's only coming from one side. So at least in the American context, it is going to become more and more specifically political and radical. Um, and the remaining trust and safety people there are going to have to make a decision of whether or not, I think there's a, still a couple of good people who are hanging on because they believe it's better to try to make things not as bad as possible uh and they're gonna have to decide whether or not they want to be part of that because it is it is going towards a chan territory for sure uh, you know people I, i've seen a few people i know who actually bought the check and i'm i'm kind of shocked and sad for them and I, do you know people who've actually bought it not i do yeah my wife i do, I do. <laughs> well business <laughs> business right yeah for her it's different i was like joanna stern i i love joanna i was disappointed to see that she she paid for it so it has become the check of the kind of a, a check of doom it is yeah, not yeah. it is not something you are i proud do not of. want to wear the cone of shame yeah it's the cone of shame um Eight buck schmuck. what a loss though what a loss i mean i we've yeah. said this before but it uh it's a shame and i you know we didn't we didn't appreciate it enough when we had it yeah and, we all and now more than ever, we, we all said, oh, it. it's a cesspool. And now we know what a cesspool looks like. And that wasn't a cesspool. Yeah. I, you know, I will always use Mastodon until, you know, we get taken down for child porn. But until then. Uh, <laughs> and you, you'll be in jail so you can't. And, use and I'll be in jail so I won't be able to use anything. But uh, no, I will. I like Mastodon as a community, but I'm not looking for it to replace Twitter. And I don't think anything I've seen. It, well, actually, Blue Sky comes the closest I've seen to replacing Twitter. At this well, point. Post News want, wanted to, but no. It, well, it, yeah. Uh, if Let's say everybody... See, it's not going to happen, though, because of these trust and safety issues, which at, at first didn't 
rear their ugly heads, but increasingly will over time on blue sky is only going to get worse. The interesting question is, can blue sky, they've got money, right? They have backers. They could definitely raise more with the amount of, are they going to be able to hire people quickly enough uh, to deal with that? And it's possible. It's not impossible. I I just haven't seen anything out of them that has indicated they understand how much of a, how urgent it is for them to. Well, they will soon. Yeah. Right. Because it'll happen. And then they'll say, oh my God, um, I don't, let's hope it's not too late. Um, Maybe Elon will sell them the blue check, the old blue check the database. Blue check database. <laughs> <laughs> How much would I you think like it exists, that? Leo, outside. I think, isn't that public? It must. Public, public information? Because, right, we saw that uh, thing where uh, only 28 people had signed up for the blue yeah. after the, uh, the the apocalypse, which means that those 449,000 people. Yeah, so we, we have a copy of We that know who they are. But, like, that doesn't help you at all because it doesn't mean that an account on Blue Sky is controlled by the same person. Right. So oh. you, you could use that to build some kind of bridge where somebody has to tweet something. I mean, that is one of the, the, the things that has not happened that Blue Sky hasn't tried yet is you could do a key-based-like verification of I am so-and-so on Blue Sky. Um, I, I expect Elon will be very quickly to block any kind of Immediately. verification. Immediately you know. block that. Uh, that's mm-hmm. the thing about a centralized network owned by an individual is you can't you can't use it. It's no longer in your control. And even though Twitter wouldn't exist without all of us posting on Twitter, by, but it's no longer controlled by us. Never probably was, but it's certainly not now. So um, if you were going to start from scratch, Alex, last question, you've probably been asked this before. What would you do if you were going to start from scratch? Presuming that we need somewhere, we need a um, some sort of public entity that uh, is the, uh, you know, you know, the speaker's corner, the, I mean, there's a lot of different things that this fulfills. Um, what would you do? Would you, how would you start such a thing? You would start with trust and safety, I guess. No, I, you have to have functionality first, but I yeah. think you have to take into account the the community people join is the product, not, not just the, the people are the product. The, the content is the product. Yes. And, yes. and honestly, I think Blue Sky is doing the right thing by making it look like Twitter because that eases the uh, adoption. Yeah. People know how to use it right out. It looks exactly like Twitter. Yeah. It's yeah. like if I go back and forth, the only difference is that little blue bird. Yeah. <laughs> it's otherwise, it's pretty much the same exact thing, which is fine. To a point of, if, I, I'm sure Blue Sky has IP lawyers, but. <laughs> I'm a little confused, to be honest. When I go back and forth, I can't, I actually did lose track of which one uh, Can I'm design on. be um, copyrighted? Certain things can be. This was the lawsuit uh, between Microsoft and Apple over the trash can. I, can't, I can't. <laughs> no. Right. There's a trash can. And Apple sued a bunch of people for, like, making rectangular pieces of glass. Right. Yeah. Right. So there is certainly a case law on this. I can't remember exactly what it was. I, I think it's patents. It's not copyright. But, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah you could patent I, a user. Who knows I'd like Blue Sky to be serif type. A nice serif. Yeah, make it a serif, and then you're done. Well, that, that's post yeah. then, which I think it sounds like post is kind of... They've had their time and it's passed. Yeah, I think we're done on post. What about Noster? N O S T R. This is a decentralized network with a chance of working. Jack is very active on <laughs> at Jack. Jack's also active on this. Oh yeah. yeah. So um, this is its own protocol, though. This is not a T pro. Uh, normal people are not going to use that. I'm sorry. I can tell you right now. I don't. I don't even know. Have you done it, Leo? No. I mean, you're the only person I know who could probably figure it out. Mike Masnick wrote a, uh, a did a write up on all three, Mastodon, uh, Noster, <laughs> and uh, Blue Sky. He didn't pick one, but he talked about the pros and cons on each. But I think Alex is really the first to bring up this kind of intractable trust and safety problem, and and I. Well, it's not technology. I think I think it's Alex is so right. You, Alex, you're incredibly quotable. Um, you're 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 born for Twitter at all, um, but but you, you're right. It's the, you're buying into you're trusting the moderation. You're trusting the community. It's the humanity. It ain't the technology. The technology is now as commodified as can be. Um, it's how well are you protected? How well can you find people you care about? What kind of good conversation can you have there? That's everything. The technology helps that happen. Yeah, here's Masnick's uh, article. Six months in, 
thoughts on the current post Twitter diaspora options. Ooh. Whatever happens to diaspora. Speaking <laughs> speaking of which, yeah. <laughs> how, how does Masnick write so fast? Uh, he's right. amazing, isn't oh, he? He's it's just, unbelievable. He's, and but and so, so fast and so accurately. I mean, I think he's. I always am very impressed. By the way, he writes off. Uh, post.news in this. It says it just focused too much on news content to be actually all that useful. T2 is nice and works <clears throat> and looks like Twitter, but it's just another <clears throat> centralized clone. Uh, I, you know, I, what I'd love to do is look at uh, Activity Pub versus AT Protocol and kind of compare the two of those. Protocols. And pick, Mike, and Mike. pick a protocol, maybe. <clears throat> Creature protocols, yeah. Yeah. Right. It the key thing is, is they have incompatible namespaces, right? And that's that's a problem here. Is it? It is unfortunate. It, it would have been nice because Activity Pub's been around for a while. I, I feel like Blue Sky could have lived within the Activity Pub overall framework and and I be, agree. become yes. like the the yes. best uh, Fediverse host uh, without splitting the namespace apart. Uh, that would have been, I think, a smarter move. But that's effectively what Mozilla is doing, right? I think Mozilla has an interesting position here as somebody who's trusted in the tech space, who has money, who has actual employees, you know, unlike a lot of these hosts, um, that they could be kind of the 800 pound gorilla and build from both a moderation perspective and a community perspective something that people attract people to Mastodon. Alex, I'm confused. I, I, you should confuse me there for a second. How is it a different namespace if I can be, if I can have a name at bsky.social and at twit.social. Yeah, doesn't that qualification make it a different namespace, aren't there? Yeah. I'm saying, Isn't but there's no interactivity there? between them, right? So it's like... Oh, no interactivity, but you could build that. Well, that's the nature it's of not, it, right? You it's can't not forbid it, is it? Mm. It's not... You'd have to build a mapping. Right, so like the AT protocol has this whole cryptographic identity that's not recognize I see. so there's okay. no mechanism that says like you're it's showing the alex at cyber villains that means nothing on blue sky if somebody else would you know registered that there's no verification other than ownership of domain right got it so okay, I, I i genuinely i i mean this respectfully I, I totally understand like this point of view i understand this being the priority i just i really think we're all missing the bus here it's not technology it's the user experience yep. it's the policies uh, Alex, you mentioned the 2024 election. Disinformation is going to be huge. It's having policies in place to address that. It, it's figuring out bad actors. That is 90% of what a social media network needs to be thinking about. And all the rest of the stuff, like as a geek, I love it. I just think it's the wrong problem to be thinking about well, here. In it sounds like the real uh, nut is verification. Like yeah. that, But that it, it's funny how yeah. often... Authentication comes up in every context uh, on the internet. Yeah. Who, to prove I you are who that, you say yeah. you are is kind of the nut when it comes to finance, when it comes to crypto, when it comes to uh, security, when it comes to tweeting, everything. Uh, we need a good, uh, we need a, you, you cover elections as well. That's part of what uh, the Krebs Stamos group does, right? Not, not for KSU, but Stanford, we study elections. You study at Stanford. Okay. That's also uh, an issue. We don't want to have to show a driver's license uh, at a polling booth, but authentication, if you're going to do, for instance, internet voting, you'd need authentication of some kind that works. Well, but it's one of the reasons that almost you can't do it. <laughs> yeah. I, I think there's really something here. And I, th I think Jay and the Blue Sky team have, have inadvertently fallen into something that I think is important. And Joshua Topolsky was in fact talking to them about this. The fact that it's invite only seems to have resulted in something that is much, much, much easier to manage with the a-holes getting in there and doing what they do. And when you have the way you get into a social media network being just an email address that anyone can sign up for, that's really good for growth hacking and getting a lot of people in there uh, quickly. I don't think it's really good for, for trust. Like when I had uh, the Blue Sky team was nice enough to give me uh, a few codes and I I'm like really thinking, I'm like, who do I want to yeah. give this to? Yeah. And I back channel it to, you know, James S.A. Corey, uh, the Star Trek Picard season three team, you know. <laughs> so you only did like sci-fi, basically. If no, it's... <laughs> no, I mean, I, I really thought through everyone I was giving that to because in a certain yes. way, I was putting my stamp of approval you're, you're on them. Yeah, that's exactly and, right, yeah. And, yep. and more to that point, Jay and the Blue Sky team had said, when people join, 
and they are disruptive and they end up having to ban them right away, they do look at who gave them the code and where it's the that chain came of trust. From. That's what the so CGP I, was I all based on. I think that exactly. So maybe if there's a social media network where the way you form an account is you have to like it only generates it has to be a friend X of a number, friend. yeah, right, a yeah. day. Maybe that's something. I don't that mind really that. That's an interesting. Abuse. Maybe that's, you could do it if you yeah. go to a Ivy League school. You get in. <laughs> no, I like that. I went to Ole Miss. I don't. I, I don't like school. that. I don't like that. <laughs> well, so I, I think Brianna is correct about why Blue Sky is okay right now, but nothing that requires an invite code is really federated, right? So that like this is going to be if Blue Sky really is wants to live in a federated world, then they're yeah. not going to be able to gatekeep for too much longer. So yeah. challenging. And is, this is why app.net failed, by the way. I love app.net. Yeah. That was the social media network that launched my career. It failed because Dalton had this crazy vision about developers all developing their own client and they wouldn't have to invest in trust and safety. And eventually the whole thing just exploded. You had the coolest people there. Everyone there has gone on to work for Google or have a massive media career or do awesome stuff. Everyone on app.net ended up being important, but it failed because they had this vision that wasn't important and was going the wrong way and it all blew up and i really feel that's going to happen again with blue sky say in a way it lives on things. through uh, mastodon right um yeah to a degree you know I, I i it wasn't directly responsible for activity pub but i i know identica i mean there was a whole chain gnu social activity pub evolved out of a bunch of and i'm sure app.net was kind of uh, informed it a little bit i'm um, a little sure. distracted by this brianna is your left bicep way larger than your right because you've been holding that no. mug no it's resting on my chair it's a so. titanium mug it's very saying, light is this, is this part of a <laughs> workout routine that it's I, me it's me flexing it's just right here i don't think i could my, elbow of my chair i just want to what's what's in the mug that's what i want to know it is throat coat tea so i can talk oh nice coughing that's yes. nice huh? i've been coughing a lot lately too with this allergy season out here i don't know oh, like where you it are. was here it's bad we have a, a super bloom because of all the rain and uh, nobody can breathe, basically, in the entire state. Uh, I have given myself a gold check. I don't know if you've noticed, but in my shot, now I have a gold check. So I am. <laughs> right. Who the hell are we? You, you have no idea. I have a gold check. I'm just I... a guy who walked into a studio. <laughs> you got the golden pineapple. So that's good. That's, that's close. Right. Yeah. Is that a uh, is that a Wi-Fi pineapple? That is a Wi-Fi pineapple. I have a that my my voted sticker in the Stanford Internet Observatory. But now yes. let me ask you about that. Well, uh, we'll take a break, but I want to ask you about Wi-Fi pineapple because I have very mixed feelings about this thing. But but yeah, you should. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. There you go. And there was another device that was looked like a gaming joystick. Yeah, Flipper Zero. Flipper yeah, Zero. Yeah. 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 I'm talking about a bunch of stuff I showed to my students. All right. Well, we'll talk that. about that and a lot more when we come back. We've got a great panel. What a I. Wow, great panel. And you know, Alex, I'm sorry uh, that you had to be here during uh, what was clearly a superior <laughs> team <laughs> beating an inferior team. But I just say together I'm, I'm, we'll I'm go down to LA. On, but I'm doing so sadly. <laughs> Play, where's the hat? Oh, 1951 champions. Yeah, I know. That's, that's good. That is not that's really good. Up. <laughs> you, 1951 champions. <laughs> We still love you. That's that's awesome. I'm glad you brought that hat. That's an awesome hat. Yep. Wow. I didn't realize the Kings had been around since 1951. Yeah, it's Kansas City. So they moved oh. back in the 80s. Were they Kings or what were they? Uh, they're the Kansas City Royals. Oh. And then they renamed to the Kings. And then there was the, the Kings. baseball, yeah. Kansas City Royals, which confused. Yeah, I wonder if it was the same ownership or something. Yeah. Yeah, I think they were the Royals. Or, yeah, I don't know if they're called the Royals, but I think there was a relationship okay. with the, the baseball team. So. Okay. Nice. Uh, our show, today, no spoilers. We don't know what happened. Something happened. We don't know what happened. Uh, by, actually, truthfully, if you cared, you were watching the game, not this. Yes, exactly. so, so I think we could put some spoilers out. I, I don't know. I feel like the overlap between us and ESPN. Is, uh... <laughs> There's a Venn diagram <laughs> with a very little slice in the middle it's, there. It's, it's Ant. That's the only. It's Ant and Alex, apparently. Ant. Yeah. Yeah. No. Our show today brought to you, you may have noticed whenever you see a wide shot, whenever uh, you see our studio, by our studio sponsors, the great folks at ACI Learning. You may say, well, well who is this ACI Learning where, when they're at home? Well, you remember the name IT Pro, right? For many years, since they started in 2013, uh, 
IT Pro merged with ACI Learning, and there was a good reason for it. Now they are bringing you all the benefits of IT Pro Plus. You get Audit Pro, you get expanded practice labs, you even get in-person study in their hubs. So much more. All the benefits of IT Pro Plus more. And you know IT Pro brings you engaging and entertaining IT training. Well, now that it's part of ACI Learning, they've expanded their production capabilities. They now have those studios in, in Gainesville are, are, are hot, man. They are fair, fired up, bringing you fresh content. You need to do that in the IT space because everything changes. New versions of software, the tests change, companies come and go. But IT Pro and ACI Learning will always have the latest content. So you, at any stage of your development, whether you're just getting into IT, whether you've got a team that needs to keep up on cybersecurity, uh, you can get what you need. If you're an IT pro and you say, I'm, I need to know more about a subject, ACI Learning and IT Pro have you covered. 6,800 hours of content, new content added every single day. Your team can get team training for CompTIA certs, for Microsoft, for Cisco, for Linux, Apple, Security, Cloud, and a whole lot more. And of course, one of the main things uh, companies want their IT team to dig deep on to get better at is cybersecurity. It's really important these days. CompTIA courses from IT Pro and ACI Learning make it easy to level up those employees in cybersecurity. Those certs are more than just proving you have a skill set. It lets your customers see you're committed to keeping your organization up to date. And uh, ACI Learning is with you every step of the way. You can fully customizable training for your team. Their team interface their platform lets you track results of individuals and teams you can manage your seats assign and unassigned team members you can access monthly usage reports you can get great visual reports which makes it easy to show the higher ups that you're getting the value it means your team will appreciate you offering this to them it will use it and will get better and learn because of it you get all the reporting you need so you can justify it to the higher-ups. They get all the training they need. It's a win all around. For teams from two to 1,000 people, volume discounts start at five seats. You can even get a free two-week trial for training for your team. Plus, they're always doing events, whether you're an individual or a team. They're always doing events to help you learn more, to get better. Coming up in May, May 18th, about uh, three weeks from now, Thursday, 2 p.m. Eastern, the All Things Cybersecurity Webinar. You'll, the special guest is Naomi Buckwalter. She's the Director of Product Security for Contrast Security and Founder and Executive Director of the Cybersecurity Gatebreakers Foundation. She'll talk about what it takes to be a security architect. She's got tips for advancing your cybersecurity career, how to bridge the knowledge gap in cybersecurity. If you go live Thursday, May 18th, 2 p.m., you'll be able to ask questions. Uh, but, of course, it'll be online. It's free to anyone who wants to find out more. Visit go.acilearning.com slash twit. From entry-level training to putting people on the moon, ACI Learning has you covered. Maintain your company's competitive edge with ACI Learning. Visit go.acilearning.com slash twit. Go, G-O dot A-C-I learning.com slash twit. And if you're an individual and you want to get started with a standard or premium IT Pro membership as an individual, offer code twit30 will get you 30% off. Twit30. And, of course, if you've got a team, Team discounts start at just five seats, so you're going to get a discount too. Go.acilearning.com slash twit to take advantage of it. It is really a, a great opportunity for both you as an individual to get into IT, for an IT professional to step up, to level up your career. And, of course, if you've got an IT team, you know they need to stay on top of the stuff. This is a rapidly changing world. It's a scary world out there. Go.acilearning.com slash twit. We thank them so much for their support. You use that twit30 offer code or go to that slash twit webpage. You're letting them know. You're sending them a signal. I saw it on twit. That really helps us. So please uh, do that for us, would you? Go.acilearning.com slash twit. Brianna Wu is here. A heartbroken Alex Stamos is here. I'm sorry, <laughs> Alex. I'm so I, I would have celebrated with you. I really would have. Uh, was it close? No. Was it close? No. <laughs> it was close until the end. <laughs> when Steph Curry has 50 points, you know you're in trouble. This, yeah, the Kings lost slowly and then suddenly. <laughs> just, yeah, just like bankruptcy. <laughs> just just <Yeah>. like. <laughs> and the fall of the Roman <laughs> Empire. It all is, it's all the same. Yeah. Uh, and, of course, Jeff Jarvis is here normally on Twig, but we're, it's great to have uh, all three of you here uh, for that conversation. So the why, tell me what the Wi-Fi pineapple is, Alex. 
uh, Wi-Fi Pineapple is a hardware device you can buy that uh, runs its own operating system. So it's a little box with a bunch of antennas popping out of it. Uh, you can hook up to your computer, and you, it has this nice little web interface and lets you do lots of really interesting and mostly illegal stuff with Wi-Fi. Uh, so, uh, and I know the guy who sells it. <laughs> yeah, is, is Hack5 been yeah, uh, yeah, a good friend? Ha yeah, he's a good friend. The Hack5. I used to work with uh, Hack5. Yeah. Um, uh, and I have mis I have mixed feelings about this. They they say it's for pen testing, and, and it is used for that. And I have used it for that. I, I use it mostly for educational purposes, right? So when I teach Wi-Fi in my fall classes about cybersecurity, yeah. my spring classes about trust and safety, but in the fall I, I teach a cyber class and I do a demo uh, where I intercept people's connections and pull up. <laughs> One of the interesting things you can do with it is you know. So you're you're the fun professor. Uh, <laughs> yes, my my ratings uh, my my reviews are really good until I get fired, right? Like that's the, uh, <laughs> uh, I think that's the fuzz here. So one of the cool things it does is, you know, something people don't really understand is that when you add a device to a Wi-Fi network um, and it remembers it, it will beacon for that. It will look for the beacon in the future. So your computer is effectively constantly saying, hey, anybody here Starbucks? Hey, anybody here is naming my home network and such. So like one of the fun demos I do is while I'm giving the Wi-Fi lecture, I'm sniffing in the background. Of course, all of the students, there's about 200 students in that class. They all have laptops open. 90% of them are probably not paying attention. Something, again, I can figure out with the Wi-Fi pineapple. Um, and, uh, <laughs> I see you browsing uh, your, uh, your, your, your uh, yeah. blue sky page. How is TikTok today? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> and uh, when they, uh, you know, at the end that I show, you know, whose network is this, whose network is this? And you have people raising their hand of like, that's my parents' network. That's the hotel I just went to and such. So it does all kinds of interesting stuff. Like one of the things you use it for is to pretend to be wireless network. So it has a radio that you can push perhaps a little bit beyond what the FCC says is a uh, acceptable level of power output uh, in the unregulated spectrum. And so what you can do is uh, if you're in a, a public network, you can have it broadcast at a higher uh, decibel level and take over and other and people will associate to it and then it will route all that traffic over uh you can have it go over like a, a gsm card or you know lte or over a you know a hard wire if you have it um and then you can sniff all of that traffic you watch it as it goes out stuff. to the internet yeah, they yeah. still think they're on the internet but they're going through right. you all stuff you can do with like a properly configured linux laptop and such right. but like this just makes it all easy and because it has its own cpu you have your computer attached you tell it what to do and then you can walk away and you can leave it there yeah. so that's often I, we have used it for penetration tests you um, a good place for it especially if you have a battery pack attached to it, uh, is the restrooms in the lobby, right? So if you can use a restroom in the lobby of a building uh, and they have a drop ceiling, you can go put it in the drop ceiling and let it oh, geez. Uh, take over Wi-Fi. So this is my mixed feelings about this. And, you know, I've never talked to Darren about it, but uh, uh, it's 120 bucks. Yes. A script kitty could use this. And that's my problem is if you're going to do it with a configured Linux laptop, you know what you're doing. Not necessarily, but yes, I, it, it is one of these interesting tools where effectively almost anything you do with it's illegal unless you're doing it in a Faraday cage, right? So right. Like doing most of the stuff. <laughs> but it's legal to sell it, even though anything you yes. could do with it would be illegal. Yes. Isn't that funny? Freedom, man. Freedom. So, so Shira Ovid at the Washington Post had a piece today saying five things you shouldn't worry about. Number one was using Wi-Fi in a public space. Okay. That's changed Light a little bit. I mean, it, since the days of Fire Sheep where you were sending unencrypted traffic and somebody could impersonate you. Right. But this thing, as 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 Alex just explained, but let me say it. So, Jeff, you were just at a hotel somewhere and using their Wi-Fi. You still have that in your list of Wi-Fis that you've mm -hmm. accessed. Mm -hmm. The pineapple can impersonate it and can be stronger than the coffee shop Wi-Fi. So your laptop, without any, you know, talking to you, will say, oh, hey, no we're boy, back no at the hotel. Password. Yeah, let's check in. Uh, it's a better signal. I mean, things are better now in that HTTPS has become pretty much ubiquitous. Yeah, right? thanks to it, Google, HTTPS everywhere. Thanks to, Google, everywhere. Thanks to yep. you know uh, HTTPS anywhere. Yeah, uh, like yep. plugin makers. Um, thanks to Let's Encrypt, the EFFs project to give which it makes it easier to be SSL. Honestly, yeah. thanks to Ed Snowden. I mean, we don't want to do a whole <laughs> Snowden thing. I have mixed feelings here, but like you know, there was a massive move to encrypt, and I I saw a bunch of that. I was a CISO at Yahoo. Yahoo would not have done all the work necessary, which was very expensive and very difficult to encrypt all of Yahoo sites to HTTPS all the time if it wasn't for the Snowden disclosure. Oh, really? Interesting. Yeah, it, it turned out it was very difficult at, at for 
for anybody who wasn't Google and therefore in a fully contained ecosystem, because there's a huge ecosystem problem. Like every bit of JavaScript you pulled in, every analytics platform you used, right? All that stuff had to go to HTTPS. And it was all distributed on a bunch of servers. Yeah. You may not even have owned all the servers. Right, right. And so it took years to get yeah. there. And it basically happened because of the Snowden disclosures, because it turned out that- I thought it was Fire Sheep. Fire Sheep seemed like the, the tipping point when, when any idiot could go into a right. coffee shop and steal your Facebook Which you could have done for a long time before that using a variety of tools. But oh, yeah. Tools of like, you had to be running Linux. You had to yeah. tweak the kernel a little well, bit. Well, see, that's my point with the yeah. pineapple. As soon as it gets easy. Yeah. So, and then there's this <laughs> Flipper Zero, which is something more uh, recent, the multi-tool yeah. device for geeks. Yes, it's fun. Do you own, it I sounds like you might own this. one, Brianna. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I don't own one, but I've certainly looked at the coverage of this. And, you know, before my comments, I really want to stress that, you know, we have criminalized white hat hacking, like in the That's United true. States. But it always has often been. My it, friend uh, Russell Schwartz was working uh, at uh, mm -hmm. Intel, did a little uh, freelance pen testing at Intel and got thrown in jail for it. A hundred percent. You remember when the AT&T thing happened a few years ago with the iPhone, right? You had people, uh, basically, they tried to cover up by uh, basically uh, uh, getting people charged. They right. done uh, basically uh, pen testing uh, and trying to report vulnerabilities. We've seen that level levied politically. So just my blanket comment here is, look, as a policy, I'm 100 percent white hat hacking. I think we need ways to indemnify people that are out there doing what I consider that are public service that's in the interest of national security. That said, you know, if you look at the Pineapple Zero and some of the things you can do with it, uh, you know, you have people with no training whatsoever that can go unlock cars. They can change the, uh, you know, the price of gas at a gas station, right? Oh, wait a minute. I, I want to know more about that. That's cool. This was reported by something I saw. Uh, but the bottom line with this is like an individual gas station. They don't have a pen testing department, yeah. right? Yeah. They don't. They're, they're so what the deal really... is, you buy a tank of gas and then tell them, hey, by the way, I've right, just uh, found right. a vulnerability. Oh, 100%. In your, in your bump. They'll give it to you free. <laughs> no, but it, it's, it's I, I get that this is a tool that can be used for good things, but I also think it is made in a way that, like, in introduces these vulnerabilities to people I have no real way to act on it. So the right? Flipper Zero was, I think it was a right. Kickstarter. It was somehow well, right. that, funded. That's what I'm thinking of, correct. Yeah, and it, and it's a, a really um, kind of an IoT. It's kind of designed for the, not for Wi-Fi, but for the, you know, the sub one gigahertz Yeah, it's, uh, it's effectively, so it's not, it doesn't do Wi-Fi. Uh, like you said, it's sub one gigahertz. There's a ton of spectrum used for IoT systems. Zigbee, um, LoRa is one. So there's a, there's a bunch of uh, standards that people use for their gardening systems and their home alarm systems. Or opening and the parking garage parking gate. Parking garage or, gate. Or the... <laughs> Or a garage door, right? Or a garage, garage door, door. Yeah, so that's or your the doorbell. With it. Um, yeah. RFID on your cards. This is effectively a super cheap version of the USRP, right? So, like, we've had software-defined radio for a while. They've often been very expensive. What these folks did is they built a software-defined radio platform. They limited its uh, frequency range to, to make it cheaper um, and then put, like, a cool little GUI on it and create a community. So there's this community of people that you can download programs onto that a little SD card and, and pop it in. So I use the Flipper Zero. I demonstrate to my Stanford students. I copy one of their uh, badges. Uh, yeah, so you can go around the <laughs> campus as them. Yeah. Right. yeah. So I can professor, door, edit right? again. Just like, Honestly, this more points up the, the, the flaw in the, uh, in the badges than it does... Yeah. anything else. Well, right? actually, can I say something about that really quickly? When I ran for Congress, one of the things I, I really got a crash course in is the way that large data and things like this, um, I always say misused by police departments, but there's certainly asymmetric defense that can be done by police departments, right? Because they do have the power to go and like Google uh, your entire like history of your Android phone and find out everywhere you've been where the defense, um, your defense that may be prohibitively, uh, you know, expensive. So it's really easy to see something like this, like someone stealing your badge and then like making it look like you're part of a crime, right? Then how do you like go and prove your innocence there? I mean, it's it's very easy to imagine scenarios. And there's not a clear policy direction here forward because we don't want to criminalize like, you know, pen testing and looking for vulnerabilities. At the same time, this is something that has a tremendous um 
capability for misuse. And I, I truly don't know where to go from here. Uh, it's only 169 bucks. I'm ordering one right now because I think we could have oh, some, some, oh, fun, some fun with it. Oh, boy. <laughs> Um, should these be illegal? No, no, <laughs> okay. no, but I, again, it's not something, I mean, the flipper is interesting because it doesn't have a humongous amount of range. Um, you have to be, it's kind of, you have to be proximate. You have to be reasonably proximate. Yeah. Um, but it, it still certainly could be used, uh, to, to steal cars and such. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> Jeez Louise. Well, Hyundai's particularly; those are really easy to steal. I hear. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I, I drove through the city, so you know, I, I cut off a couple of catalytic converters because it's what you do. Yeah, you just uh, pick pick them up, take them <laughs> with you. You never know when you might need an extra. Right? Yeah, yeah. Wow, it's an interesting uh, time we live in. Um, fortunately, the good news is most people are honest. Yes, it's only yes. that small. I don't. I don't know one tenth of one percent that have the larceny in their hearts. Ruin it for everybody. And they ruin it for everybody. <laughs> so only sell to the good people. Just like you only let the good people on the blue sky. Exactly. Or you don't need trust and safety. Yeah. <sighs> hey, speaking of trust and safety, online safety bill is coming to the UK. It's in front of uh, Parliament right now. Uh, if it passes, uh, websites will have to do age checks. Yeah. Age requirements, Woo. it's got a bunch of requirements around age checks. It was being pushed by a coalition of companies that sell age check services. Uh, so oh, yeah, not, interesting. Not Color um, be shocked. I, but at is, one it, point, they were saying you'd have to go into a pub and prove that you were uh, over 13. Right, like an, an older <laughs> version. I'm, I'm not totally sure what the, the plan is here. I think that now you can do an online one. Yeah. An older version of the UK law, which uh, failed, was you had to go into like a pub or I think- um, <laughs> Maybe the post grocery office. Grocery store. Yeah. Some... Any place that does ID checks already. Yeah. And then they'd give you like a, a, a number. Um, Excuse me, I'd like to see porn. <laughs> hey, Joe, this guy wants hey, to see porn over here. I want to see right. porn. Right, right, right. All right, right. show me your idea, governor. Right, I'll, I'll take the scotch, the Marlboro <laughs> Rose. And, and a porn ID. And a, yeah, porn a Pornhub uh, login. Yeah, so <laughs> it, it's got a lot of scary stuff in it. I, I think a number of people have not been paying attention to Europe. Uh, now, obviously, the UK is not part of the EU anymore. They're going their own way on child safety. The Between the Digital Services Act and the Online Safety Bill, there's a huge number of requirements for American companies that are kicking in already this year and that there will be more if this one passes. Um, and, and some of them are reasonable. stuff on encryption, uh, too. Some of them are reasonable and some of them are not. Like, and in, in one of the real downsides of the UK encryption, uh, the UK bill is it's not clear that end-to-end -end encryption will work with uh, the requirements. Um, that that's a huge one so because, huge one. Uh, and by the way, as an example, and we're going to see more of this. Wikipedia has said if this passes, we're not going to do age checks. Uh, and the, and now, of course, does that mean there's no Wikipedia in the UK? Or as one government official said. Oh, don't worry, because only sites posing a high risk to children will be need age verification. But Gee, who's I'll look, look at the trans entry and see what the GOP yeah. says about that with schools. Yeah. I mean, there's no there's yeah. no safety anymore on speech in that way. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, let's talk about the digit. Because so this is not yet law, online safety bill. We're going to keep watching it. Uh it's expected it will be, however. It's headed that way. I, I do think this is this is really emblematic of what's happened in the United States as we've really ceded our willingness to you know take a an active role in you know technology and how it shapes our lives. We've just made the collective decision to to set it out. You know, uh, except for your partner Alex Krebs, who I closely watched. Chris Krebs, did excellent jobs, excellent Chris, job. Chris, right? Yeah. Uh, yes, yeah. Chris. Yeah. Uh, uh, but I mean, largely we've sat out any kind of interest in shaping how technology is going to face our lives. And, you know, I think you can look at what Europe is doing. I don't agree with much of GDPR. I don't agree with large parts of this. Mm -hmm. But the reality is, if we are not going to take an active role in this, other people are going to do it. And they're going to make decisions that affect all of us that we don't necessarily agree with. Blue Sky is going to run head first into with their decentralized uh, idea of how uh, moderation works. They're going to run head first into Germany's laws on hate speech. I don't know how they get around that. So, you know, this is, it's part of a, a larger symptom of us just being uninterested in doing the job of governance very much to our consternation. The Digital Services Act, which is the law in the EU, requires companies to do risk management, conduct external and independent auditing, share data, 
with authorities and researchers and adopt a code of conduct by August. They announced this week, EU industry chief Thierry Breton said on Tuesday that there are 19 U.S. companies that would be subject to this. It's, it's, Vlops. They're called the Vlops, very large. The online. Vlops. You have to be big, uh, including uh, five Alphabet subsidiaries, two meta platforms, two Microsoft businesses, Twitter, yes, Alibaba and AliExpress, yes, Google Maps, Google Play, Google Search, Google Shopping, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Amazon's Marketplace, very importantly, Apple and Google's app stores, uh, who will very, in all likelihood by August, have to have alternative payment methods. Uh, Apple has already ind ind indicated that, well, if we do it, it's only going to be for the EU. Right. That's Don't the Digital Markets Act, which is in parallel. But yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Digital services, digital markets. Yep. 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 Um, what, so where does encryption uh, stand globally? I know in the UK and Australia, it's... It's really on the verge of being illegal. Right, especially right. in the UK. It end is on end. the verge of end-to-end yeah. -end encryption. Effectively, so the Digital Services Act, there was a big push from civil society to re to get rid of uh, proposed parts of the Digital Services Act that would have made end-to-end -end encryption hard. So we're okay in Europe for now. Um, India has been in a fight with WhatsApp. Uh, that is going to the Indian Supreme Court. This is because um, Modi wants to be able to control yes. what it, news uh, Indians get. Yes, and WhatsApp is by far the most important platform. So India is a fascinating example in that the most important social platform there is end encrypted, which is not true uh, pretty much anywhere else. I mean, I guess except Brazil, Brazil, another you're right, another developing countries. Um, and, and Brazil just went back and forth on uh, WhatsApp. They yes. they banned it. They briefly. banned it. So one of the interesting things in Brazil is like independent individual judges have a huge amount of power. So you end up with a situation where you have an individual judge ban WhatsApp or. Uh, order the head of Facebook uh, Brazil, who's a sales guy, who has nothing to do with encryption, order him arrested. He's been arrested a couple of times. I think he has like a bag packed if, in case he has to spend the weekend. Poor, yeah. poor guy. So, um, Oh, actually, Telegram was uh, banned. Is not not WhatsApp, but Telegram was banned in yeah. uh, Brazil. And then and then uh, and then another judge said, "Oh, never mind." Yeah, and, and this is a, a a constant thing in Brazil is the legal system. You know, it, it comes to eventual consistency, but it, there's a big back and forth. Yeah, and they, they were uh, Telegram was banned because um, uh, th they. Uh, the messaging company denied requests to reveal the personal data of users who had been sharing extremist hate messages. Yeah. So uh, protecting the identities of their users, they got banned. And then another judge says, well, that's too, that's draconian. We don't have to ban them. Right. Uh, Telegram has said we might have to leave uh, Brazil. But that's so the problem the with UK all of this. One, though, like you said, is end in encryption. And you've had WhatsApp and Signal both say, we will not comply. So you're you're going to end up, Wikipedia is not the important one. WhatsApp and Signal are on that's a huge. collision course with the UK yeah. government. Uh, and, and so what ultimately, uh, if the UK insists, WhatsApp and Signal say bye-bye? We don't. How do you say goodbye to a country? Uh, you could block them. I mean, you could block, you know, WhatsApp is based upon phone numbers. So you could block all the plus four fours, right? Um numbers you could ask for you could go into the app store and be delist de yourself you could geo block based upon ip address there's a variety of options yeah um you certainly can technically do it I, it is something that facebook has threatened before but never done i think google has threatened it but has never done um and this might be this might be the change because this is not a situation in other situations the companies have threatened it because of a law they don't like but it's been something often that they can follow without breaking the entire world in this case if you break encryption there you break it everywhere right like whatsapp would have yeah. to rebuild their app they'd have to build back doors um and so there's realistically no way to do it and in doing so they'd almost certainly break the law everywhere else because they've made a bunch of promises in europe in the united states and such under which they're being held to uh, and so there's, I, I don't think any good way for them to follow the UK law without being in, a, 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 a breaking the law in a variety of other important jurisdictions. And I want to, I agree with that. I also want to say the the fight is here beyond services. It actually comes down to hardware as well. I was on a BBC panel uh, recently 
talking about um, when it comes to uh, basically wire, wireless communication protocols. Uh, when we move to a new protocol, you know, China has some very different uh, views on encryption and privacy uh, than, than we do here in the United States and the government's ability to get in there and look at things, right? The tendency is always going to be for governments to agree with the protocol that, you know, allows intelligence and law enforcement mm -hmm. to, to look at that. So when we are seeding a role with this, you know, China ends up building a lot of these things. So it, it's going to have long term effects on all of this. So, you know, it, it's just a very, very troubling shift in public policy. Uh, one I think could really get dystopian. Joe in uh, our Discord chat says, I love to dunk on Meta as much as anyone, but Facebook enabling end to end encryption for WhatsApp was the biggest privacy win in history. Yep, well, that's true. I, I've been saying that. Like, it, and I've said that to you, European, it, European parliamentarians do not like to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it is absolutely true that, like, over a, a it basically there's a 90 day period. Over that 90 day period, at the time, about a billion people ended up with full. Uh, protection of all of the content that they're sending to one another. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, how, what, a, what a difference uh, something simple like that can make. Yeah. Um, well, the battle, you know, we've been talking about this for years now, you know, because the FBI has been demanding uh, back doors and so forth. And there doesn't seem to be any resolution. It seems to be just two opposing parties and with no good answer in between, right? There's no way to do this that doesn't jeopardize other people's security and so privacy. There are options for end-to-end -end encrypted products to provide more safety for people. And unfortunately, folks in the government side never consider those. What are those? Is it a key escrow system of some kind? or Yeah, so without key escrow, which is really a, a type of backdoor, you can have better reporting systems, right? So that's something that WhatsApp has invested in that they still could do a lot of work on is helping people who are the targets of abuse to report that and to deal but with it. But how do they report it? Because only they can see it. But they can report, they see it, and then they can report it. In, uh, in, the unencrypted version the of unencrypted it. The unencrypted version. And what you can do is what we did with Facebook Messenger when we shipped. Have a hash or Messenger. something. Exactly. It's called a franking code. So there's a, a mechanism so somebody can't fake it. So you can't create fake CSAM or something and send, oh my God, the send I'm person getting sent this. me. I'm yeah. getting this. You can, it's the, cryptographically verified that it came from that person. The, the server can say, oh yeah, it's the same message. Right, because it's signed with the public key effectively of the person who sent it. Uh -huh. Right. So every every message is signed and encrypted. Well, that's you a can, good way to handle it. Yeah. And so you could do that. You can. One of the things I'd like to see companies invest in, and I've been advocating this, we, we ran a number of uh, events at Stanford where we brought people together to talk about this. And unfortunately, the companies have not made more direction here is on pushing a bunch of the classifiers and other trusted safety functionality into the client, right? Where it has to be decrypted. So if you are getting a bunch of death threats or say you're a woman online, like a woman who if there's any way to contact her, she will get uh, unwanted pictures of male genitalia, we'll say, right? Yep. That is a yep. common thing that happens. Um, and so you could have a classifier that if a man you don't know sends you a, an image that it's like, oh, I know what this is, and it blurs it, and it says, did you want this person to send you male genitalia? And you say no, and it automatically blocks the person and reports it to the platform. Um, it does not have to. Wow, we need that percent. button. Yeah, that's a that's a good button. You start that company, please. Yeah. Right. Well, the problem is the people who have to implement that would be Apple and and what's it? And, yeah, the people and, who do and, the messaging service. It has to be built into those because it has to be in the app, yeah, the and, client side. And Apple, to their credit, you know, when they announced a bunch of effectively very complicated backdoors, the other thing they announced was doing some of that stuff, and that is something they've kept on doing. And they are they implementing brought, that now. They are implementing that for, so for parents for primarily. Parents, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so. Now, They've started I, that I do have to I push think. back on that a little bit because they were talking about doing it in a way that, I mean... Well, they were see, talking uh, about two different things. There was the CSAM scanner, yeah. which they have now abandoned. Right. Uh, and I think that a lot of privacy advocates, including you, Alex, said that's a, that's a not going to work. Uh, but this parental thing is, is very different, right? Uh, but I want to hear Brianna's uh, objection. Well, I just want to make yeah, sure, no. Brianna, you're making the distinction between the two because I agree with you about the first, well, but... I was talking about the Apple system where they came forward and you're right, they did abandon it, but they were looking at basically scanning your photos and then basically alerting parents. Well, they do do that. Your, if your child was looking at sexual imagery, which I can tell you is a queer kid in Mississippi, right. like that could have gotten me killed as a child. <laughs> right. So Just Apple moderated a little bit. So now it says yeah. to the kid. It, so my understanding is there's no notification for parents anymore. 
what you can mm-hmm. do is you can say this this account basically can't send or receive naked photos in iMessage. Sure. And that is a client side classifier. It is a new DD classifier. It does not either classify for CSAM or check against hash lists. And it basically right. tells some uh, the, it tells the the kid you can't send a nude, right? Yeah. Right. Or or you can or receive one. Or receive one. Yeah. Would that, uh, but and that's in messaging. That doesn't mean you can't go on a website or right. But the same kind of idea can be extended. I mean, that's just one purpose. Can right. be extended to if you're an adult and somebody sends you a death threat. That that's classified on the client side. You have no relationship with that person, and you don't have to see that content for it to say to you, "Hey, somebody sent you something hateful. Would you like to report it without seeing it?" And so, I, I think I, that's kind I of have stuff to say, that. I have a lot more experience with that. I, I was literally swatted this week, and yeah, I saw um, that. I'm sorry I, about that. Jeez, no, it's it's fine. But I'm saying, death threats. I have no faith that machine language is ever going to be really able to crack down on harassment because it's so context dependent. Yeah. Like the things, there are just a million ways to talk around it or to not trip those things. So I, I just, I, I think every single social media network, including Facebook, has tried to automate these processes with machine learning and semantic context analysis and, you know, all these various ways. And it's great. It saves money, but I think it really comes at the expense of, of, of accuracy in my view. Which yeah, is because- why I think you have to work on the reporting side for end to end and then you have human yeah. beings look at the reports and then you ban people from the ended encrypted network. Yeah, that makes harassers sense. have learned that an overt uh, threat is actionable, but you can you can couch it in such a way that it's not actionable. But the recipient knows perfectly well what you're saying. Yeah, and so, those things are hard to detect because it's nuanced, right? So there are things you can do. the The problem, the hardest thing to stop in any of these, is a conspiracy between consenting adults, right? If you have adults who want to do something illegal using ended encryption, whether that they are planning a terrorist attack or they are trading CSAM. That is the hardest thing because there's not a participant in the conversation who will report it, right? Because they're they're both part of the conspiracy. And that's yeah. what the UK wants. And I think that's just something that we can't solve while also providing privacy. And so I think we have to choose to provide people privacy and we can focus on the other kinds of abuse types where there's a victim who is part of the conversation and protect them. So what do you oh, think, uh, Brianna? I would like to hear your opinion of what Apple is has implemented um, uh, protecting uh, kids because I, yeah, there was I less mean, pushback hearing, on that. Yeah, I, I'm only hearing it here, like this implementation. I'd need to read more about it. From, from the way you've described it, it makes sense to me. But I think we all know with these kinds of policies, the details really, 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 really matter. And it also really matters, um, you know, is there auditing, is there oversight, are you reporting stuff to government agencies? I mean, there, there's a lot of stuff here to critically think through. So uh, you can read about it. Uh, they call it communication safety and messages. Apple, as usual, has a pretty good white paper on it. But basically, they're saying messages now includes tools that warn children, warn children directly and provide helpful resources if they receive or attempt to send photos that may contain uh, nudity. Uh, it right. blurs the photo before it's viewed on your child's device, provides guidance and age-appropriate resources to help them make a safe choice, including contacting someone they trust if they choose. Yeah, uh, they doesn't, that's good. doesn't block it. Yeah, I think it's kind of, Apple has, I think, been very responsive to the concerns they've heard and are trying to find a way uh, that works. And it seems like a good system. Um, uh you know, parents have to yeah. turn it on, too. It's not going to just happen. What, so. One of the problems is when they f- had their first version of all this, they kind of they, did a very apple thing, which is they did it all in-house. They have the smartest people in the world there. We can figure this out from first principles. And because they didn't want – they never work with anybody on the outside of Apple, right? Like in trust and safety and cybersecurity, it is extremely hard to work with anybody at Apple. And so they, they didn't talk to anybody. Um, they came out. They just busted through the wall like the Kool-Aid man with like, oh, here's a – CCM scanning tool yeah. and all this stuff, and it was not a great idea. Once again, if there's a moral here, yeah. consult experts. <laughs> right, right. And so they did a whole listening tour. I know they talked to a lot of folks. They actually visited us at Stanford and chatted with them. Good. And Good. Uh, I know they talked to a lot of child safety advocates and you know uh, a variety of advocates for, for different equities. Uh, and I think this is the, the compromise they came up with. Here's Brianna. Did, just, did they report just, things to law enforcement? No, can I ask? no. Not anymore. Mm-hmm. So, okay. like, if you look at the NCMEC reports, it's actually kind of stunningly small, which is one of the things they're trying to deal with, is that Facebook reports about 22 million pieces of CSAM per year. And the last one I saw, I think Apple had, like, 200. Right. Which okay. is it's hard to think about, like, there's there's not 200 bad anything on a billion user network, right? Like, the, the step, 
the first step for something bad happening is 10,000, right? right? Um, and so what that 200 is is actually a big question for a lot of folks. Yeah, where'd those come from? Uh, one of the theories is it's it's CSAM that's been sent via the iCloud email, right? right? Which would be a silly way to do it. And therefore, right. that I've heard a couple of theses of like what services does Apple have that are unencrypted that people could move images around. This, uh, just uh, for you, Brianna, is what the screen looks like. This is from Apple's website. If I were to send... Uh, or you were to send a child a, a sensitive photo, the photo is blurred, then there's a message that pops up that says, you're not alone and can always get help from someone you trust or with trained professionals. You can also block this person, and you're given a choice of message a grown-up, ways to get help, block, contact, or cancel. And so if you wish... Or if, view the photo. Yeah, <laughs> if you wish, you can cancel and view the photo. If you said, oh, no, no, I know what that is, and I want to see it, um, but I think this is a, I, I like yeah, this. That I makes think. a lot of sense. Yeah. That I think this is a good way to do it. Uh, and I think it solves that problem. It doesn't solve the CSAM issue, but that's a very difficult issue. It's very difficult. And it's the mass trading of CSAM is, is mostly not an end to end encrypted messenger issue because WhatsApp and iMessage are not the best ways to move huge amounts of CSAM. The best way to do that is via encrypted like locker, the megas, um, a variety of dark websites and, and, you know, Tor hidden services and such. Yeah. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, I, I think, but the one of the problems is law enforcement, like they their hammer is lawful access to content, right? Like that is all they understand is I have access to your text messages. I can prosecute you. And so everything's a yeah. nail, even if there's other more subtle technical solutions in place. Right. Uh, actually, I encourage you to read the the entire Apple page because I, uh, to me, it really uh, there's more images and there's just so much that they've done and I, that is done right and I gives me encour it encourages me that they're spending this energy to do it right, right that they could continue to do it right in other areas but as well. To go back to our original topic, I don't think this is compatible with the UK online child safety law. I that's a problem. That would be considered enough. Yeah, see, that's a problem. Uh, let's take a little break. Great panel, couldn't be better. Brianna Wu, rebellionpack.com. What is Rebellion Pack? Uh, we use a large array of tech tools to win elections. Uh, so <laughs> we do micro targeting. We use large data to figure out people that uh, they believe in causes, uh, but they uh, may need a little bit more of a, uh, a push to get out there and actually vote. So uh, we use uh, basically all the data we can to uh, activate them, and we win elections that way. It's uh, going to get busy oh, for cool. you in a couple of years, isn't it? It's going to be very, very busy. <laughs> this wow. So wow, 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 wow. I was wow. really proud. We helped uh, We helped win the uh, Wisconsin uh, SCOTUS race. Um, you know, this was the most uh, that ever been spent in any uh, Supreme Court race in history. There was a lot on the line, and we just airdrop volunteers out there uh to go out and canvas and and make calls so we were in uh, uh in europe during the election uh so it was a little hard to follow the story but we definitely were following the story uh yeah. big big election very big election we were uh, very there. proud of that one yeah uh jeff jarvis is also here your book the gutenberg parenthesis comes out next month june june so i guess it's almost next month. almost next month uh gutenberg parenthesis.com as we said, buy it from Blackwell's. That's uh, it's one Jeff's. Place, yes, one of Jeff's preferences. Yes, one of one of many. Just buy it. It's, that's where you really can. Thank you. This week in tech is brought to you by Noom. So one of the other things we did while we were overseas is uh, eat a lot of uh, cornettos and croissants and pan au chocolats. I had some cacio e pepe. I had some pasta carbonara, and you know, I'm, we got back. And both Lisa and I are going over to the scale going, oh, boy. I mean, when you go away to Europe for three weeks and you eat all this great food and you're on a cruise ship where there apparently is a meal at any every. They even had a midnight buffet called Death by Chocolate. You you realize <laughs> that there are many opportunities. So Lisa gets on the scale. She said, oh, I lost two pounds. And I'm going, why? And then I looked in and I said, I'd gain no weight. And in both cases, I think we can credit Noom. We can really thank Noom. Brianna, you did Noom and lost 100 pounds. Noom, now I should promise, I should not promise anything like that. Uh, Noom, first time Noomers lose an average of 15 pounds in 16 weeks. But, and I didn't, I have to say, I did not follow any particular prescriptive diet in Europe. I said, I'm going to eat what I want. But one of the things that works about Noom is it's, it's not a diet. It's a psychology 
plant-based approach. Believe me, I have done every fad diet known to man. And the problem with fad diets is when you go off them, you gain the weight right back. Noom's a little different. Noom uses psychology, not fads, to help you make intentional and sustainable choices that are aligned with your values and your weight loss goals. What does that mean? It means you learn about why you eat. Well, you know, Lisa and I both have this fog eating thing where we eat without even being aware of it. I get home from work and I start stuffing my mouth. We're watching TV. I make a big thing of popcorn. And it just, it's not that I can't do that anymore. I, you know, I still love my popcorn. Uh, but, but Noom helps us be aware. And when you're aware, suddenly it's a lot easier to make good choices, even when you're faced with Cacio e Pepe. Every journey is different. With Noom's psychology based approach, your daily lessons will be personalized to you. And to your goals, there are no bad foods. I loved that. There, are, There's no forbidden. You can, and time off is fine. They use scientific principles like cognitive behavioral therapy to create sustained long-term changes in your relationship with food. And that's what's key. It's not a diet. It's nourishing, not restrictive. Uh, it focuses on progress, not perfection. You can, they've got all kinds of levels of support. Uh, you can log your food, you can do the weigh-ins, you can have an individual coach, you can have a group, uh, five-minute daily check-ins, personal coaching, whatever works for you. The lessons are great. You can really learn a lot from those lessons. Uh, I spent about 15 minutes a day because I wanted to learn more. First time numerous, as I said, lose an average of 15 pounds in 16 weeks. Nine. This is the key to me. 95% of Noom customers say Noom is a good long-term solution would you agree brianna you've you've lost a lot of weight and you've kept very, it off you look great very strongly i i think people can look at me go back two years and look at what i look like on those twitch shows i didn't even I, someone showed me a picture of it i did not even recognize myself yeah. i've kept over a hundred pounds off for two years with noom it is not hard it changes the way that you think about food i was down in disney for the last two weeks oh, and oh. you just i i the the way it works is it changes it makes you just aware of what you're eating so you don't like you make very deliberate choices deliberate. right yep. so if i'm gonna have like the caramel popcorn i love at epcot <laughs> i can do that i just need to like not make other crazy choices yeah. during the day that make my calorie budget explode it gets to a point like your body doesn't want the garbage like i've not exactly. had it in two years because it just doesn't sound like something that tastes good to me anymore yeah. like it's it, i love noom i i still use it i pay for it it's great endorse a thousand percent yeah me too and lisa uh too you know i, I know i leave food on my plate when i didn't used to do that i used to be a clean 100%. plate club right and now if i want that monte cristo sandwich at the pirates of the caribbean uh, I will eat half of it maybe or a quarter of it and then leave the rest. It's okay. The other thing Lisa and I both do now because of Noom is we put our forks down. We turn off the TV, we turn off the phones. We put our forks down, close our eyes and taste the food. I didn't used to taste it, believe it or not. Stop chasing health trends, build sustainable healthy habits with Noom's psychology-based approach. Sign up for your trial today at Noom.com slash twit. Noom, N-O-O-M dot com slash twit. Sign up for a trial today. Check out Noom's first ever book, The Noom Mindset, by the way. Just came out, a deep dive into the psychology of behavior change, and it's available wherever you get your books, even Blackwell's. Uh, N-O-O-M dot com slash twit. Brianna and I and Lisa all are believers. One of our uh, chatters lost 60 pounds uh, on Noom uh, and has kept it off. Uh, it's just, uh, it works. That's all I can say. It works. Uh, and we thank Noom so much for their support. You support us too. It's important. Noom.com slash twit. You know, we haven't talked about all day, and I find it very refreshing. We haven't mentioned AI. <laughs> well, a little bit. You talked about the it's AI over. onslaught. It's yeah. over. I think AI is over. It's over. Uh, that was a big uh, deal. It wasn't over. I'm glad we hadn't because last what? week was RSA, the, the, the big security yeah. conference in San Francisco, and yeah. it's all everybody was talking about. It was, it was AI. It was AI. Well, I, and one of the things I don't like about Twitter now is there's a disproportionate amount of AI. It was like when blockchain was big. It was There's a disproportionate amount of attention paid to it. AI bros. It's all AI bros now. We have three bros, NFT bros, yep. crypto bros. But that doesn't – the problem is – 
that gives it cooties that it probably doesn't deserve. Well, this is what's so difficult is, and I, it's a question I ask and I've been asking since uh, chat GPT went public, uh, actually even before that with Dolly too and, and stable diffusion is, uh, you know, we, t did we talk, we did, we talked last week. I thought about Jaron Lanier's and we talked on Twig about it, about Jaron Lanier's, I thought very good article in the New Yorker uh, saying there's no such thing as AI. What AI really, what we're seeing anyway, the AI we're seeing today is really more of a uh, collaboration between humans. Everything it says, everything it draws is based on stuff it, it's basically mashing together from humans. And so in, if you think of it that way, instead of as some sort of evil intelligence about to take over the world, eh, it's a little bit more, uh, less, less intimidating and a little bit more, frankly, realistic as to... Uh, what it can achieve. When I was in Italy, uh, I went to uh, Open AI, and it was blocked uh, in Italy. Uh, the Italian regulator was concerned about privacy. Um, Chat GPT is now back after meeting watchdog demands. Chat GPT and Open AI had always said, "Well, Chat GPT doesn't say anything." Open <laughs> Open AI has actually it does it says a lot, but it's meaningless. Uh, Open AI had said, "Well, uh, no, we're very careful about privacy." I think they reassured the regulators. Uh, they fulfilled, according to the AP, a raft of conditions that the Italian Data Protection Authority wanted satisfied, uh, and so the ban uh, was lifted. But uh, it ain't over uh, until it's over, and uh, I think the uh, I don't know if it's the Digital Markets Act, but the EU is. So there's a new AI Act that they put together very quickly. Oh yeah, they have a new one. Oh great. So uh, these are folks fo focused on risky usages, and there's our favorite uh, Margarete Vestager at it again. Risky uses of artificial intelligence that threaten people's safety or rights, such as live facial scanning, should be banned or tightly controlled, EU officials said Wednesday, as they outlined an ambitious package of proposed regulations to rein in the rapidly expanding technology. I wouldn't disagree with them on face recognition. Right, which in the U.S. we only have that in Illinois right now, yeah. um, which is how you end up with a number of facial, facial recognition companies being able to work and even... We end up as taxpayers paying for them because a bunch of police departments uh, yeah. end up paying those facial recognition companies, uh, yeah. which there's been a number of stories of people being uh, misrecognized and uh, arrested. Um, uh, some pretty sad stories there. Uh, but yeah, the AI thing, it, the interesting thing I think for Europe and AI companies is Europe has such a big focus on effectively the right to be forgotten. And so how do you train a large language model on a petabytes of data and then ignore some little part of it that says that somebody was arrested at some point, which they have the right to remove that from the Google index. Do you have the right to remove that from oh. AI? Oh, um, and I that's think that's that's where a bunch of these fights are going to be is, is where is it practical to retrain or or maybe what, what they'll end up doing is just like certain people... If I said you, you know, I want the right to be forgotten from OpenAI, maybe Alex Stamos is just becomes a on a, a list of words. An unperson. Be, I'm an unperson, right? Like they instead of retraining the the entire thing, which would take the power output of Bolivia uh, for <laughs> for a week or whatever, uh, uh, they just uh, say that these are certain people that you can't talk about. So the EU says they're taking a four level risk based approach to okay. balance because they want to balance privacy rights against the. Innovation. I don't think any country wants to say no AI, right? Because that's clearly, you know, something that's happening. I mean, there's a there's a good quote. I forget who said it, but the the British Empire did not win the Industrial Revolution by outlawing steam. There you go. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I think people want to be careful. The Chinese have been much more aggressive, actually, in in the use of AI, and I think that that's been controversial, folks. Yeah, use and control both. Oh, but in the right. use by the control, yeah, right. And their, well, their regulations could, they are, control are, it. They control. It. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. That's, yeah, uh, we, uh, unlimited AI, Let's but we control shopping. it. <laughs> yeah. So the EU, I think, I have to say, the things they've talked about make sense. Face recognition, uh, the use of uh, AI systems to filter out school, job, or loan applicants. Uh, that's that's clearly fraught with peril. Right. Uh, they would ban AI outright in a few cases considered too risky, such as government social scoring systems that judge people based on their behavior. Uh, that's something they have done or at least tried it in, in certain cases in China. Uh, that's clearly something we don't. Yeah, we don't yeah the want. problem there is not the technology. It's the bad judgment of the government official who would use it badly. Yeah. 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 Well, that's often the case, isn't it? Right. Uh, yeah. 
which this is also much more reasonable than some of the people who freaked out and said, like, you have to have a moratorium on people building large language models and, Ugh. you know, get ready. Let's to, take six to, months to, off. Right. Yeah. Let's take six months off so we can catch up uh, and, and bomb <laughs> data centers. You know, um, the, the actual application of the AI is where is where the rubber hits the road. And that seems like a totally reasonable place. To I love it. The problem with AI, you just did it. Uh, you just said it, uh, Jeff, is people. It's how it's used. Right. Um, yeah. Unacceptable uses uh, also in the EU would include manipulating behavior, exploiting children's vulnerabilities. Whoa, 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 whoa. Let's stop there. Let's stop right there. Whoa, yeah. Manipulating behavior, like like all media don't manipulate behavior. Like all advertising isn't manipulating behavior. All politics isn't manipulating behavior. Oh. What does that mean? Yeah, but you don't want AI to do that. You want real humans doing that. If you're gonna right. It's an important job, and you don't want to take the job from the, the European <laughs> yeah. politicians. But we don't want what we don't want is Russian troll farms generating hundreds of thousands of AI generated accounts. Yes, because th they really care about the law. Right? Yeah. If there's well, anybody, not if there's anybody them, who really it? cares about EU law, it's EIP <laughs> provision. It's Russian troll farms. <laughs> I love it when you see uh chat GPT error messages in replies to tweets. That's right. always hysterical. You know, they say, sorry, I can't talk about that. Yeah. Uh, so you bring up a good point though, talking about chat GPT. I think the, there's a there's a lot of smart stuff here in the EU regulation. The problem is the EU and everybody else is focusing on open AI, Microsoft, Google. Those people have teams that more or less are thinking about these things. They're better than the others. And yes, and the problem is not necessarily, there will be uses of their platforms that can be harmful, but they will at least react to that. A ton of this stuff you can just run on your NVIDIA card at home, right? right? Um, our team at Stanford, we did, we have a preprint out where we tested GPT-3 uh, generated disinformation against real Russian and Iranian disinformation. It did just as well. And now we're regenerating it with stuff just running on my RTX 4090 at home, which is great because now I can write off my- uh, I was my just going to say, good deal. <laughs> yeah, it's a, good, it's a good deal. How did you get one? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're uh, easier to get than they used to be, yeah, I have a feeling. off a truck. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It turns out, you, you have that flipper zero. Uh, oh, there you go. <laughs> just open those uh, pod bay doors, Hal. Exactly. Um, so uh, there's also this thing, AutoGPT has become very popular now. It's a uh, GitHub repository that basically merges- uh, chat GPT with uh, if this then that and suddenly a you've got uh, AI insane. with agency now <laughs> I'm scared to me <laughs> now I'm now I'm actually scared I mean automated home stuff is already so janky you're like what I'm going to throw into here is this humongous large language model that says totally unpredictable stuff. <laughs> turn the lights on turn the lights off roll the lights garage on. door yeah. yeah I'm sorry Hal I'm sorry Dave I can't I open was, the garage day, day door <laughs> I, I was so confused with something Nate Silver said on Twitter yesterday so he was arguing that these kinds of uh, uh, large language model uh, searches were better than conventional search uh, now and I have to say, I've spent a lot of time using the new Bing, which overall it's excellent. Like start asking it programming questions or, or how to write sample code for a language, you know, it's really impressive stuff. But if you drill down and start trying to solve real world problems, like I was trying to get it to get me information about how to score in one of my pinball machines, <laughs> it just starts like hallucinating yeah. and mixing facts together. It's not in even hallucination. Way, it's just... Yeah. All it is is a word assembler, right? A word predictor, right? We all know that. 100%. And so it's irresponsible, in my view, for Microsoft to have started using this with its search engine. It's irresponsible for Google to consider it. I'm eager to hear your thoughts on this. It's irresponsible for Kevin Roos to act like it fell in love with him when it knows better. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, that uh, generates link, uh, clicks. I mean, I think well, that that's the problem is the, the yeah. Yeah. Um, it's a fascinating technology that it can do interesting things, but its relationship to fact is not built in, right? I, I entirely share your assessment on this, and um, I don't think it's better than normal search currently. And it's understanding the underlying technology. I think there are non-trivial like hurdles for it to get over to like stop hallucinating, show facts clearly, show sourcing clearly. And it's it's not better right now than just clicking on an article from the New York Times and knowing that I can trust that, right? So I I I, I, think I would there submit are there are some uses please. for um, AI in search. It's sure. just that it shouldn't be. I think AI chat is more of the problem. In, in AI seems to be very good at summarizing existing content. So you feed it a PDF, it summarizes, and you don't see a lot of hallucination there because it's working off uh, an actual database of content. Um, That's fair. And I yeah. think so. I think uh, AI could re reasonably uh, replace a, a spider 
in going out and summarizing websites and then making a better search and index, couldn't it? Um, I use, you know, I use, um, uh, among other things, I use Neva as my, as I've mentioned before, as a search engine. Neva, like another a variety of other uh, search engines, gives you an AI generated summary of your answer first. And I often find that quite useful. Now, we've talked about this on Twig before. It provides you with footnotes uh, to refer to the sources. So it doesn't seem to... Or sources it finds after the fact, which is that's also correct. interesting. That's correct. Um, yeah, I'm not sure, actually. Uh, that's an interesting uh, question. Right. But, but uh, I mean, I have to agree with Brianna and uh, JJ here. Like, this is... It was in... I think it was irresponsible for Microsoft to roll out uh, chat G GPT uh, connected to search because people believe that search should be... Yeah real right like they, they have a, a level of belief in kind of in looking at the product of, of what it returns is accurate as a number of people have shown if you ask about something it doesn't know about it will just come up with bs and that can That's include correct. it lying about you right like it you can oh, make it says it, people are dead all, all the time yeah. right right or you yeah. can make it you know why was this person canceled and it will create and you know, oh, let me make up of, why, of why yes. this person was canceled yeah. why this person was fired from their job right um be, based upon things that have happened to other folks right. um and so it there's a big difference to me for like what, what OpenAI did, which is like they built a tool, a game, a, a play, a playground, a sandbox that you can play in is very different than attaching this and saying this is part of this. Yes. Yeah. yeah. There's a, there's a really interesting video out there um, where someone gets basically chat GPT to code. Uh, uh, what was the name of the flappy bird flappy bird? Uh, right. It creates the AI, another AI program created all the art assets. And it goes through and it like, creates all the steps that you're going to need to create a, a playable version of this game. Um, I, I think it's really good for creative things like that. I don't think it's really good at sourcing in my experience. Leo, the use case you described, like go through my email and tell me like what all the emails from Jason are. Yeah. Saying. That is a that's limited with the sources it's doing. That's something I think it's really going to be good at. But I think this broad declaration that it's going to be better from search. I, I invite your audience, make your own assessment. Go to Bing, find some subject you know a lot about and start asking it questions and see if those answers are accurate. Because that is not been it's been a very confidence shaking exercise. Here's what uh, I even think it's a mistake to call it hallucination. Because yeah. that is part of the anthropomorphization. I know. I agree. Uh, and it's, and lying. it's just word <laughs> order. Yeah, word salad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's word. If salad. we said, if, if we said, that rather than acting as if it writes, it doesn't write. It assembles words. Yeah, that's all it does. Here is uh, new Neva's uh, AI summary of who you are, Brianna Wu. Born July 6th, oh boy. 1977, American video game developer and computer programmer. That's from Wikipedia. Co-founded Giant Space Cat in an independent video game development studio with Amanda Warner in Boston. Also a blogger and podcaster on matters relating to the video game industry. Well, I can vouch mm -hmm. for the fact that you're not limited to the video game industry. But other than that, yeah. it's not too no, bad. All right? of these things are sourced just from Wikipedia. Yeah, notice yeah, that's that. Just my but that's good. And if Wikipedia were wrong, that would be wrong. Which uh, I have to say, like one wrong. of the problems with Wikipedia <laughs> is... Um, Brianna has dealt with more abuse than I have, so she's probably better protected. I have randos. We're, I'm, yeah. we're in some political issues right now. People yeah. don't like uh, don't like it when you study uh, people lying about the election. Uh, right. And so, as a result, Wikipedia effectively lets anonymous people uh, just use their IP addresses without authenticating to edit my Wikipedia page, yep. uh, which I'm so really it's enjoying. not a definitive source. Is it? it is. It is I, not. I, have a, I have a story about that. Yeah, I mean, so I if you're if you're super famous, if you're Joe Biden. There's a ton of people watching, watching if it. anything, yeah. your, your account's locked or whatever. Yeah. If you're not notable enough, they delete you as not notable. I'm in that horrible middle where I'm <laughs> notable enough yeah. that like I can't argue that they delete the total page, but nobody's paying attention. And so I'm pretty sure I know who one of these people are. People don't like me. They can just go. They don't have to log in. They just right. use their IP, a random IP address and they can change stuff. And then if I go in and say, this isn't true, they turned off my account right. for doing that. Right. And so it's like Wikipedia is like actually a great example of what you have to be super careful pulling from if you're AI of anything that has to do with, with individuals. Yeah. So a student came out of classroom one day and saw me in the hallway and said, professor Jarvis, professor Jarvis, I just saw that you're polyamorous and your wife's okay with it. Oh Lord. Oh, I oh, said, no, what? 
Uh, what? Uh, and my wife is absolutely said, not okay with it's it. It's in Wikipedia. <laughs> I said, uh, somebody hates me. Uh, the first wiki wow. divorce. That would be. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Jimmy Wales as co-respondent in my divorce. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, oh, the I'm Supreme so Court has oh, weighed in. Oh, oh, Brianna, you've gone through a million times more. I yeah, but, I mean, uh, I, I, I think people's marriages should probably be left out of the public <laughs> fray. That's just me. I don't know. Oh, Lord. Well, it's in Wikipedia. It must be true. That's true. So uh, Leo, I, I, I don't want to spend time on it, but I just wanted to plug something on line 72. The New York Times had a pretty good explainer of large language models. They just took a set of Jane Austen and then they took screenshots of it, learning words and then learning Jane Austen, how many steps it went through very, very fast, very quickly. Um, I think it's a pretty good explainer that gets people to understand what this is doing and how it's doing. So at first it doesn't even know what a word is. It's just coming up with characters. So it's, it's garbage. It's gobbledygook. Complete garbage. Right. Yeah. But it's and then down. as you continue, it will uh, get smarter, yeah. Uh, <laughs> After 250 not rounds, much you smarter. Two <laughs> words come out. Mind you, 250 rounds in a matter of seconds. Yeah, that's the thing. That's what's interesting. So when you see that delay, it's uh, actually doing this. It's going through stuff. Uh, of course, uh, I also refer our more uh, computer literate readers and listeners uh to uh, stephen wolfram's excellent article on how yes uh, how it works it's a little bit more if you're mathematical. trying to you're trying to show your aunt what this stuff is yeah by, uh, a teach not, podcast. not aunt pruitt aunt, aunt martha no no, no yes. your aunt me, your aunt <laughs> uh so it's interesting this is actually a great uh, piece it's from the upshot um i'm not sure i would always trust the new york times take on ai as no, Kev, I wouldn't. Kevin Roos says praise it. Yes, <laughs> but 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 this was well done. I think this is uh, very well done. And if you want to get really nerdy, I recommend uh, my colleague Andrew in at Stanford CS has a Coursera course on this. That's, that's oh, nice. Yeah, it's quite good. Andrew Ng. Yeah, and and G. And G. And then Coursera. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to search for it right it's, now. It's Chat GPT. What is the best <laughs> online course about AI? <laughs> hey, is it the AI for Everyone course? Is that is that? Uh, so there's an AI for Everyone. Then he has a, a deep one. Uh, that's that's an engineering one. Yeah. Ah, nice. So depending on how uh, geeky you want to get, you can right. also. Well, it's it's basically a copy of what he teaches at Stanford. And for all the people that talk about we need to put you know have a pause or put the genie back in the bottle, that's that genie is out. Um, oh, if, if I did my math right, I think. This quarter, just this quarter, 15% of Stanford's undergraduates are taking the intro to AI class. Not 15% <laughs> of CS students. 15% of, of all. Yeah, one five, 15%. Holy percent, just this quarter. Cow. And so, you know, like that's the kind of knowledge distribution that, you know, you can't put it back in through regulation and such. You're, you're going to have to regulate the impacts and mitigate the the dangers. You're not going to be able to, to stop people from doing more work in this space. Yeah. But it's lemmings over the tensor chip. Jeez. So uh, help me because I uh, I'm so overwhelmed. It's not the first time technology topics have overwhelmed me. In fact, it's kind of been the story of my 40 years covering this <laughs> stuff. Is it's, it's it's like drinking from a hose. Um, <laughs> but uh, in this case, I'm so overwhelmed by the stories and the information on AI that I've kind of started to tune it out. That I that really? I try trying to understand it, but I am not, for instance, going to Product Hunt and taking a look at all the f new AI startups every day. <laughs> um, am I missing out by not doing that? Is something magical about to happen? I think you're probably going to be blindsided for 2024. <laughs> so well, that'd be interesting for the for the presidential yeah. election. You think? Yeah, I think that I think it's going to play a major role in disinformation and you know creating false sen sentiment this time around. Um, but I I'm just feel like it's worried. impossible to keep up uh, at this point yeah. with what's happening yeah. in AI. Am I wrong, Alex? You think? It's hard. I mean, there's a lot of it, there's there's a lot to follow. There's a lot going on. Uh, I think Brianna's right. 2024 is going to be best. The RNC already had a AI generated ad. Now, yeah, the they got a little do, trouble for it. Yeah. And the AI didn't really do anything. They obviously did it because they wanted the story to be that they used an AI generated ad. So they got a huge amount of free play for, for this ad of, of people criticizing it. Um, not, they're not, I don't think they're the folks who invented that little political trick, right. Of having a controversial ad that you put $10 behind, but you get a, a 
a million dollars in free airplay. Um, but, you know, it's not going to be next time declared by by the RNC with a little disclaimer of uh, on the bottom as well as who paid for it. There's no reason why you can't do that on a um, individualized basis. And you can have, you know, those kinds of ads be going out to much, much smaller groups. And so it, one of the fascinating questions will be a number of companies have been kind of diluting their standards around political advertising. Um, Twitter, for example, threw away a lot of them. Facebook is opening up to allow, are they going to allow AI generated political advertising? Cause if so, if you can break people up into hundred person groups and then AI generate 50, a hundred different advertisements, both the voice and the video, and then do a B testing. That's the kind of thing that you could build upon what people did in 2016 and 2020 and really yeah. shoot their stratosphere. Cause you no longer have to have somebody creating the art, creating the script. If it's all automated, you could test 10,000, a hundred thousand ads and then find the 10 that work in those 10 different segments and then put all your money behind them. Somebody is definitely working on that now. I'm sure. Uh, but that's I a really good idea. I do. This. <laughs> I guess he's going to do it. First. Oh God. Really? Here it is. Yeah. You gave it to rebellion pack. Great. This video is now going to be shown at a Senate hearing. At but some that, point. But that is, this, this is like the beginnings of Upworthy. When it was the best of intentions, it ruined every headline on the internet. That is, that that is though, right something now. we learned in 2016. I remember very well, uh, we learned how you can make small, many, many small buys on Facebook yes. and really mm -hmm. do it as a human, but really uh, fine-tune. And fine-tune, right. So that's one of the things the Trump campaign did that the Hillary campaign didn't, that's right? right? Like, if if you roll back to 2016, we talked about 2016 last time I was here, so I don't want to do too much. That's right? okay. But if, if, you, <laughs> if your thesis is Facebook through the 2016 election to Trump, it is not Cambridge Analytica, it is not the Russians, it is the Trump campaign's proper use of the Facebook advertising platform yeah. helped by Facebook sales engineers. Right. They actually had embedded engineers in the, the campaign. Side. Right. Which yeah. was offered to both sides, but only yeah. the Trump people, the, the Hillary people made these beautiful videos that they showed to everybody in the country. And Trump's team made these much cheaper ads and then tested them against and all they show them at segments. 10 people at a time right uh, you, 100 is the minimum 100 all right so you can show it to 100 people you test it for 100 people and then if it the the 10 ads you test to 100 people the one that works you show it to the 10,000 people using look-alike audiences of the other unemployed steel workers in michigan for yeah. example so that but that had humans, right? Human beings assembled all those. Ads. Imagine AI now. Imagine AI doing this. Was it Brad Parscale who was really the wizard behind that? Uh, he, I mean, he was the guy running that team. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I have been <laughs> for the benefit of having nothing to do with that personally. So everything I know, I've read afterwards. Uh, so I can't speak as to what he personally did. Yeah, yeah. I, I do have to say, so, and this is the, the reality of this, it's a good scam, but as I'm thinking through it, the problem with doing ads on Facebook is a lot of them get reported and a lot of them get uh, taken down. You're speaking from experience. I am. Yeah, yeah, they get, because when you put something out there that people don't like, they report it, that triggers Facebook's algorithm. They take it down, even if it's 100% compliant, and then you're waiting for uh, a human to step in and then your news cycle has has gone by the problem is if you started putting stuff out the ai had done eventually the ai is going to churn out stuff that is going to violate the facebook terms of service it's definitely going to get reported and your entire account is going to be banned so i think this is where Facebook's aggressive policies on political advertising, as much of the headaches as they cause me, I do think they would they would make this a very difficult scam to pull off. Is Facebook going to be the place to do this in 2024, or is it over for Facebook? Interesting question. Facebook is the only place worth political advertising. Twitter does Still, not matter for to this elections. Day. Yeah. I've tried it. It does not matter. When you're talking about linking the databases of who the known voters are, Facebook is the best place to do it. And 80% of the people who actually vote are on Facebook. As that's status an important. No offense. No, no but offense. that's an important number. 80% <laughs> yeah. of yeah. the people who actually vote are on 100%. Facebook today. If that you're trying to reach the normies, true. it's still the place to go. Yeah. That is correct. So that's the place oh. to watch. Do you feel, Alex, it, uh, you used to work at Facebook. Ain't You're not there anymore. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> after they tried to lay it all on your shoulders. But, no, do you feel like uh, they understand how important this is going to be and that they are going to do what needs to be done? Well, yes, there's people there who understand it. The problem is they've had 
round after round of layoffs. Right. And this last yeah. layoff, unfortunately, included a bunch of people who worked on influence operations. So the, the team that I helped start, I did a little bit to start. And then that really grew for the 2018, 2020, 2022 elections is being decimated by layoffs. And so one of my fears here is um, Elon Musk has created kind of a permission structure for Mark Zuckerberg to do like half as well at on everything integrity related because he's still 10 times above what Musk is doing, right? And yeah, so he's lowered the bar. In he's lowered the bar and, and, and created a structure in which as long as you're not out, not out there retweeting disinformation yourself, <laughs> right? And then like defaming people. You're or calling, okay. You're okay your in my book. employees pedophiles. <laughs> yeah. You're, you're doing better than Mark. And, um, and so in this new age of efficiency, I'm really afraid that as he pours all this money into VR, which I think is just a stupid investment, um, mm -hmm. that the place he's cutting is on integrity. Uh, and so I, I, I don't know how good that team will be for 2024. So, Brianna, good luck. Oh. I mean, maybe you'll get a lot more ads approved. Well, you know, <laughs> know what that, you've yeah. decided, Brianna, is to fight fire with fire. I think you learned I, the lesson. I believe in. I I don't believe in unilateral disarmament. I mean, I think we can have a larger discussion about how elections are funded and the tools that we use. But until those policies are passed, I think you fight with the same tools your enemy does if you have access to them. So, and uh, I'd rather win than be morally pure. That's how I feel. Yeah, I think that's a it's a fascinating conversation. But we are going to defer that for a moment. Uh, our last ad, and then last thoughts. I wish we could go for another five hours. There's so much to talk about here, and you just opened a whole Pandora's box, but you'll come back before 2024, I hope. Sure. Uh, both of you. All right. <laughs> How, one more question for Alice real quick on that. How many? Uh, what proportion of the friends and colleagues you had at Facebook are gone from Facebook now? I, I, so I'm not saying these people aren't replaced, but uh, unfortunately, like every child safety person uh, I worked with, uh, uh, almost all of them are gone. Um, I know at least three or four people were fired from the influence ops and the threat intel team. Um, so there are there are still good people who are trying it, but I, just proportionally, I know that these teams have been. This is where a lot of the savings are coming from. Like they Ouch. they just you know they they cut a bunch of money. They they're rewarded in the the stock market because without revenue going up, profitability right. went back up. Um, so I think Mark's getting a positive signal on this, and will continue cutting that most recent quarterly results. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. And uh, trust and safety doesn't make you money, and unfortunately, it doesn't make you money. And if Elon's going to do none of it then yeah. all you have to do is some of it, right? Um, <laughs> you still look better than Elon. And the, the other thing that honestly is happening is you now have a politicization of things that used to be agreed upon. Like yeah. Russian agents should not be able to run political ads in the United States. It used to be a bipartisan position. That's no longer effectively a bipartisan position. And so if you're going to be in a situation where you're going to get yelled at in a house hearing because you've done the basic things to try to keep bots and trolls off your platform, then you might as well decide this is a politically dangerous place where it is better for us to quote unquote be neutral. From my perspective, neutrality is not being neutral. You are choosing a side. You're choosing the side of the trolls and the bad actors, but I don't think that's how they see it necessarily inside the company anymore. What is often the case- Can I just, can I just say something about that and add on to it? I yeah. think this is why it's so important that those of us that work in the political sphere I think it has never been more important for us to constantly reiterate that our highest principle here is democracy, free and fair elections, democracy, democracy, democracy. Every single time I get a chance nowadays to go talk to a Republican on a show, I really try to make that the point of view that we're coming back around and agreeing on because you're you're absolutely correct. This has been weaponized. And I really think it's it's terribly bad for the country. If we agree on nothing else, we should agree that our elections but, are but free. Do they agree? Fair. Brianna, do they agree? They're, they're, Some they're of them not, no one out they're loud is gonna say, Oh no, I I don't believe in democracy. Well this shocked me when I when I studied, you know, years sure. ago, studied uh, and I, I'm not making Godwin's rule about to be hit. When I studied World War II Germany, um, democracy was an enemy. Democracy was something that you did not want. It was said out loud. That was the point. And on certain places, I think, in this country now, we're getting to that point where um, uh, a major public radio station did some research recently, and they found in their audience that the word democracy is a turnoff. So I, I hear what you're saying. I think that is why it's really up to us that are reasonable actors in the space mm -hmm. in both mm -hmm. parties to constantly hammer this this point home, because I think you're right. There are some people that are so frustrated they would throw all of this out the window. And I think that it's really important for the adults to model different kinds of behavior here.
There's also a kind That's of a word. weasel word That's that uh, people who want to eliminate democracy use called illiberalism, where they say, well, this is a we're in a governing system that hides its non-democratic practices behind formally democratic institutions and procedures. And so this is a great conspiracy theory where you say, well, it looks democratic and I'm all for real democracy, but we don't live in a real democracy. We live in an illiberal democracy. And, uh, and that's one way to get around. I'm sorry, I shouldn't provide them with weapons, Brianna, but that's one way to get around. That's how they get around it. Yeah. What you're yeah. proposing. And you wouldn't think anybody be against democracy, but, uh, this way they can they can say that. Well, they, they also couch it in, you know, do you want, when people talk about like direct election of the president and the, the national popular vote compact, well, then you have California and New York making all the decisions, right? right? Like right. they couch it in these very, right. you know, not so secret racial terms <laughs> yes. of like, yeah. you know, like the, these horrible places you where get, people it, actually live. Yeah, um, yeah. Which, you know, talking about as a Californians, we only have one senator right now for 40 some million people, right? Like, it's a, that's a, that's a different can of worms still. Oh, Lord. Let's take a break and we'll uh, get back with uh, a final uh, thoughts with uh, a sterling, sterling panel from Rebellion Pact, a pack, uh, rebellionpact.org, if you want to uh, find out more. Uh, the wonderful uh, Brianna Wu, I'm sorry, dot com, not dot org, rebellionpact.org. That's it. Um, uh, she is on uh, Twitter and Blue Sky and Mastodon as Brianna Wu. I think you can search That's for it. her in all three platforms. I'm only Brianna Wu. I'm only Brianna uh, on Blue Sky. So oh, thanks for complicating matters. Yes, all right. Sorry. About only that. Brianna. You know, follow me and, uh, and I'll point you to her. Uh, also, <laughs> also uh, great to have Alex uh, Stamos here. He is the director of the Stanford Internet Observatory, Stanford I.O., uh, and also a principal in the Krebs Stamos Group, great place to go if you're looking for help along these uh, lines. It's a troubled time. I feel like if if you were a dark horse candidate for 2024 and you listen to this show, you might see an opportunity uh, to create a campaign out of nothing. Um, Mike Pence, here he comes. I'm not saying that Mike Pence should do anything about it. That's Jeff Jarvis, <laughs> uh, a.k.a. Jax Javros from... BuzzMachine.com, our superhero. Big joke. <laughs> Gutenberg parenthesis.com. Our show today brought to you by Lookout. That one thing the pandemic has really changed is people are not at the office as much as they used to be, right? Hybrid work is here. Remote work is here. Business has changed forever. The boundaries to where we work or even how we work have disappeared, which means the boundaries to your data have shifted. It's always on the move. It's on a device. It's in the cloud. It's across networks. It's in the local coffee shop. Now, that's nice for your workforce. It can be a challenge for IT security, especially if IT is struggling with multiple point tools in a, in a variety of different platforms that are all incompatible, and you spend a lot of your cycles just trying to get stuff to work together. You need Lookout. Lookout helps you control your data and free your workforce with Lookout. You gain complete visibility into all your data. You can minimize risk from external and internal threats. You can ensure compliance. That's getting more and more important. And by seamlessly securing hybrid work, no matter where your data is, you don't have to sacrifice productivity for security. Your IT people will love it because their work is a lot simpler. They don't have that complex multi-tool environment. It's a single unified platform. Lookout reduces IT complexity, giving you more time to focus on whatever else comes your way. Good data protection. It does not have to be a cage. It can be a springboard letting you and your organization bound toward a future of your making. Visit Lookout.com today to learn how to safeguard data, secure hybrid work, and reduce IT complexity. Lookout.com. Thank you for supporting our show, Lookout. We appreciate it. And you check it out, okay? Lookout. Dot com. Uh, oh, there's a bunch of little things. Supreme Court has rejected a computer scientist lawsuit. Oh, before I do that, they are telling me that I should probably mention we have made a... Is this going to be AI Leo again? A fabulous yeah. promotional announcement with my <sighs> alter ego watch. 
And Dolby Cinema, there are these little blue lights that go down the stairway, and I can't not see them. I spend so much time energy not looking at them that I, I don't see the movie anymore. You know, so I understand that. Once I took ayahuasca, I could not uh, avoid seeing the machine elves everywhere. So it happens. <laughs> and once you're once once seen, you can't unsee it. You know exactly, what I'm saying? Exactly. Hi, I'm Machine Elf. Previously on Twit, Tech News Weekly. Start with the Protecting Kids on Social Media Act, which is here to protect kids from social media, apparently. The basic thing is it's it's age verification. They want parents to verify age of teenage users. The big difference with this as opposed to many other of the state level bills is that they create an age verification system through it, or they create the thing that will create it. All about Android. Google Authenticator has been around since 2013, I believe, so a very long time. Well, they finally added it. Two-factor authentication codes now sync with the Google account. Because when you set up a new device, once you you log into that new device, the authenticator will be automatically set up with your account. Mac Break Weekly, where some Utah college kids essayed a very challenging hike that got them to a canyon they could not get out of. They didn't have a cell signal. They had iPhones and were able to use their iPhones to save themselves. That's that's a really great story. I'm sure Apple will turn it into a commercial. Twit. Those, Those kids, poor kids are going to gonna have to go down into the pit again. That's the only <laughs> bad thing to do the ad. Hello? <laughs> Leo is stuck down here with the machine elves and no one brought their iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> We have, by the way, wow. uh, we have an AI Leo in our uh, Discord, and uh, I have been informed that AI Leo, if you mention him in our Discord, will automatically heart you. So he's kind of starting to get his own little, um, <laughs> own little uh, world of its wow. own. Wait, yeah, did, did you take ayahuasca, Leo? No. Oh, phew. But I have friends who have, and they insist the machine elves are all around us. <laughs> uh, all right. Supreme Court. Back to the Supreme Court. Rejects computer scientists' lawsuit over AI-generated inventions. Uh, the trademark office refuses to issue patents for inventions that Stephen Thaler's, uh, he's a computer scientist, artificial intelligence system created. He sued. The justices said, no, no, the lower court was correct. You can't. Or no, I'm sorry, the Patent and Trademark Office was correct. You cannot patent that. So I guess that's a victory for humans. I yeah. don't know. Supreme I Court. Mean, this is what my husband does. So that that sounds very much in line with patent law and you know how novelty works. Like they've they've traditionally really frowned at uh, computer generated algorithms ending up with patents. Well, and they're kind of agreeing with uh, Jaron Lanier that it's really just uh, generative based on other things humans have done. So right. it doesn't. It isn't novel in that sense. So some yeah, would argue it, it doesn't for raise artists. the the novel, the novelty, and the the creativity argument yeah. of that. Yeah. yeah. Supreme Court will be reviewing, and this is going to be more interesting. Um, they agreed on Monday to consider whether the First Amendment bars government officials from blocking critics on social platforms like Facebook and Twitter. And what's weird is I thought this had been decided already with Trump back in 2021. It turns out that it was mooted because Trump got out of office. Right. So the Supreme Court did not have to uh, decide that. Uh, Trump had blocked some people on Twitter. Uh, a lower court said that violated their free speech rights and he had to unblock them. The Supreme Court never did decide that. So now they're going to have a chance to uh, decide that. They've got actually two competing uh, decisions from lower courts. One said yes, one said no. So we'll see. Uh, we'll see where they go with uh, with this one. Yeah, I mean, this is interesting because it's actually about school district fo level folks. You're not talking about the president. Local, anymore. local, and, baby. And, yeah. Uh, I actually, I, I hope they come up with something a little more nuanced where they allow people to block on their personal accounts, but perhaps if you have like an official account, you can't uh, because the kind of abuse people get if they're just on the local city council or these days if they're on the school board is spectacular and i can't they should not have to deal with abuse there needs to be a way to handle abuse without blocking legitimate feedback right right whether you agree with it or not it's feedback so yeah this is a yeah that's good this is an appropriate thing for the supreme court to look at i guess yeah um what else just kind of trying to i have so many stories 
Uh, Alex, you put in a couple of uh, stories. One is that Twitter is complying with more government demands under Elon Musk than they did. Now, that's not a good thing. No, no, this is more demands for both data and for censorship. Uh, and the numbers have gone up, uh, especially in India, uh, which is, uh, you know, something I've, I've pointed out from the beginning is uh, you might not know this, but Elon Musk owns a car company as well. Ah. Uh, and that car company really <laughs> wants to sell those cars in India. Now the world's most populous. And country. China's a big market for him, too. And China's a huge market for him. And so, you know, you end up with a situation where they have a huge amount of leverage over him. Uh, for his other purposes. Imagine if Mark Zuckerberg, all of his money was actually tied up like in a Chinese pharmaceutical company, right? <laughs> like um, that's effectively what you've got here. Uh, and, uh, you know, Twitter, despite all the talk about free speech, has actually complied in a much larger number of times about turning over data and censorship on behalf of a number of countries. And I think India is the most interesting one here uh, because India is going into an election year as well in 2024. Modi is consolidating power using a variety of different uh, legal means. Um, and whether or not American companies allow that to happen on their platforms is something they're going to have to really consider. Uh, obviously, there's there's huge downside. He already blocked TikTok. Um, so he has demonstrated that he is willing uh, to take very aggressive action against companies that make him angry. Uh, and it looks like Twitter has heard that message. Also Erdogan in Turkey. Erdogan in Turkey. Yeah. Obviously, Putin. China is not that relevant because China actually just blocks these entire platforms. All, the whole right? thing's blocked. The whole thing's blocked. But it's really yeah. interesting. As we move towards a more authoritarian governments all, all over the world, yes. there is going to be more and more pressure. In fact, it's not merely that Twitter has not refused any of these requests, but they're getting a lot more than they ever got before since Elon took over. Yes, they're getting more requests. Um, I think people see it as a new opening. Uh, countries see it as a new opening. Uh, Twitter has a long history of pushing back against government requests for data and for censorship. They, they fought this over and over again uh, around the world. Um, and all the people that used to fight that uh, have apparently been fought. So I, uh, it, it's worth adding. This is probably not ideological. I mean, it's very expensive to, you know, hire lawyers to do all this work to to stand up to this kind of uh, you know government demand for data. I look at, uh, you know, when the Twitter files were released, uh, I do believe Twitter's chief counsel quit. I know they've lost legal resources across the board. And you, know, you can say a lot to criticize Apple, but they sure went toe to toe with the FBI and dedicated, like they put both their reputation and a lot of money on the line, like doing the right thing for user privacy here. And I think when you have a steward like Elon Musk, who, you know, his bottom line is not to any principle, it's to stop Twitter from hemorrhaging money. I think it's entirely unsurprising. This is the outcome we're seeing. He's also a bit of an authoritarian though, don't you yeah, think? Fair, um, fair, you know? fair, yeah, fair, 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 fair. But I would, I would think in this case, I, I personally would not attribute this to a conscious decision, but rather him just not caring about the details, which is a, a pattern that's happened to his companies uh, that's fair. for a long time. Let's end with a happy note. I know I had to really dig for this one. <laughs> this is the wrong panel for a happy note. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like it's a cherry panel. Uh, no, it's, <laughs> this is a realistic panel, a realistic panel. How about this? But it was yeah. this day. 30 years ago, that CERN, which owned the copyright to the World Wide Web, because Tim Berners-Lee, a physicist at the uh, Swiss Particle Accelerator Lab, uh, invented and re released the World Wide Web, it was on this day that CERN said, okay, it's public domain, let everybody develop uh, web pages, and, and literally approved this uh, April 30th uh, in 19, what is that, 1993. So uh, this is the day the web was born. Happy birthday, World Wide Web. Happy birthday. You have been an unmitigated success. <laughs> nothing bad has ever happened <laughs> because of you. Worked out really well. Oh, like, come on. Wikipedia part. Uh, oh, yeah. Well, you I didn't know that what, what, what inspired that to a great extent was that the University of Minnesota was going to try to basically charge for gopher. Oh, you're kidding. And... Uh, Murders Lee thought that was ridiculous and said, no, 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 no. And so uh, the, the contrast created it. So it was on this day that, that CERN gave it all up. No conditions. Wow. Well, thank you. I, I remember my CS course the year this happened. I was taking one at the, the college level, like, because there was obviously no computer science. 
like a program at my high school in Mississippi. And our final, when this happened, was to uh, create your own web page. I remember staying up all night trying to figure out how to wow. create my own web page. It was Voltron. It was a bunch of pictures of Voltron. <laughs> it was so bad. How old were you? But I did it. Oh gosh, I would have been <laughs> like fifteen. Like fifteen or sixteen. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. The first real use of the World Wide Web. A Voltron. What I love too is is in the is in the CERN document. In no event will CERN be liable to anyone for any damages arising out of the use of this software. (laughs) Not our fault, man. (laughs) See, they knew. They had a they had a premonition. They knew. Well, as Jeff will say uh, again and again, uh, there's been a lot of good that's come out of the World Wide Web. Frankly, there's a lot of good that's come out of the Twitter. Uh, and Facebook and all of these places. Uh, and so it's easy to focus on the problems, but it's also uh, important to remember that even Wikipedia has its uses. <laughs> uh, hey, it's really great to have you. Brianna Wu, rebellionpack.com. Uh, anything else you would like to plug? How's your speed running going? Uh, I'm not doing much speed running. I want to give out a shout out to the Dedham Police Department. Oh, um, yeah. I you saw know, that picture. Yeah. I, I got I got uh, swatted last week. And um, you know, this often goes really, really wrong. They did literally everything correctly that you could oh. ask law enforcement to do in this situation. Yeah, I think that's really cool. Like Dedham's not the biggest town, and they handled this extremely skillfully. Did they know about you machine. ahead of time? I and mean, we were they i mean i ran for congress so i assume they kind of got yeah to you know they might have like a bulletin board where you know you might see this uh, and it might they be a swat a few times for speeding too so well, i knew about you, know, you for that too um, yeah but uh, no i mean i'm that I'm, woman I'm, driving the boxster you know her well yeah, don't, you know yeah, don't, yeah, geez, yeah. she's a good person car normally doesn't go very fast <laughs> yeah well <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, good, good on it. them. We'll We've been swatted once we'll too, and a and a law enforcement department that doesn't come in with tanks and guns a blazing is a blessing in a case like that. Uh, yeah, I really appreciate it. Brianna, that. what's what's the what's the quick tip to law enforcement agencies out there about what they should do? So the number one thing is if you're getting the claim through an email address that you cannot verify, uh, most police departments have tools to you know look up your Google address or something like that, which is a whole privacy discussion we can have. But you know ultimately your Google, uh, like a Gmail account, is tied to a database and they can get a sense of who you are. Uh, often for swatting, uh, they use anonymous services like ProtonMail. So if this happens, that's you pretty be much very, a giveaway, isn't it? Yeah. Right. It, yeah. You should be very suspicious about that. And I would say if you're a major target out there, like I was unsurprised that I got swatted. Yeah, I had reached out to the police chief in town and had talked to them about some of the threats I had ahead of time, which I don't know if it made a difference, but it's certainly smart on your behalf. Yep. So, yeah, just be proactive. Um, and police departments, they really need training about frankly, being more skeptical in these situations. Yeah, here's the tweet and a picture of the very nice uh, people at the Dedham uh, Police, police uh, department. department. Well done. Uh, That's um, all five of their police cars. I believe, so. <laughs> <laughs> so it helps that they don't have tanks. Uh, you know that that makes a little bit of a of a difference. Yeah, when we were uh, see, it's it's kind of lazy to swat somebody by an email. <laughs> it just doesn't seem like they really their heart is in it. Uh, we were swatted with a phone call, uh, and so it's a little more credible oh. when somebody calls and says, "Well, I'm not sure I should give them a roadmap for that," but no. Uh, thanks to the Petaluma police, uh, I think they realized that there was, although we did have to leave the building and have a bomb dogs, uh, sweep it. Um, Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. They didn't have any bomb dogs in Petaluma, so they had to go down and get the, get the bomb <laughs> oh dogs God. from Marin. <laughs> so it took a little while. <laughs> Only uh, have chicken dogs and, uh, yeah. bomb chickens I'm, in Petaluma. I'm, I'm glad you're okay, Brianna. Uh, and, oh, I'm fine. And, and I'm yeah, fine. shout out to the dead MPD. I think that's a good thing that Petaluma doesn't have bomb dogs. Yeah. I, I remember my admit weekend for Cal, they brought out that the UCPD was very proud that they're one of the only university police departments to have a bomb robot. Yeah, thanks no. to the Unabomber. That's nothing at to the be time. Of, Yeah. And it was of... my parents like, no, no I don't oh, see that as a positive. <laughs> wonderful. So that's good. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, Alex Samos, you are a, a, a really a, a huge asset to the community, and we're very grateful when you spend time. Amen. Came all the way down from Sacramento, missed the second half of the Warriors Kings game, just to be here. I really am grateful. Thank well, you. Well, as far as I know, Sacramento won. That's going to be they won. My, and that's good news. That's uh, gonna be going to be my <laughs> internal monologue here. I don't have to check. Yeah. Stanford in an observatory. Stanford I/O. If you're lucky enough to be a Stanford student, take some classes. Uh, yeah, Gene, trust and safety now. It's too late to sign up. Uh, but I'd love to have you down on June 7th. My my uh, students, 36 of project teams, build these uh, trust and safety uh, responses. <gasps> oh, let's robots. cover it. Oh, oh, we'll bring a camera. I would wow. love okay, well, to have you be that. a guest judge if you want. Oh, I'll be a judge too, but we, I think that would be fun to around. cover. Yeah. Fascinating. Um, so we you do it on Discord because Discord doesn't catch any of the uh, trust and safety problems. So uh, you can... Oh, so it's easy to create them on Discord yeah, yeah. is what you're saying. Right, because oh, we don't great. have to worry about Discord uh, catching anything. Um, That's true. But if, if I'm going to plug something, it'll be uh, I with my colleague at Stanford, Evelyn Dueck, uh, who's a law professor. We have a, a podcast called Moderated Content uh, every Monday. Uh, about this kind of stuff, so um, it is. It is a brilliance sandwich, a brilliance sandwich. Yum yum. Uh, moderated yeah. content wherever yeah. finer podcasts are uh, aggregated. You can get it on iTunes or Spotify. There's an RSS feed uh, as well. So if you like this kind of conversation, I like TikTok boom. That's good. <laughs> you got some good titles in there. That's great. I it's, like uh, it. We had pretty good timing on creating this podcast. I gotta be honest. Yeah, no kidding. No kidding. Moderated. <laughs> content and of course uh probably don't need a plug Krebs Stamos group is uh the place to go to get help if you need it yeah because a lot of people get their enterprise uh management consulting uh tips from podcasts so <laughs> <laughs> should we do yeah, KSL group slash twit and uh should I put something there yeah sure well, yeah maybe <laughs> maybe that would be the thing to do no actually just go to ks.group and uh you don't need a, a referral code uh, building a better, safer, more secure technological future. I think we're in favor. <laughs> we're in favor. We're 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 behind. We're behind you on that. That's important stuff. Thanks, Jeff Jarvis. I'm gonna see you uh, this Wednesday on this week in Google. He's at yeah. BuzzMachine.com and his book's coming out in June. GutenbergParenthesis.com to pre-order it. Uh, and of course, you teach a few classes too in these kinds of things. Now and professor, again, professor of journalism at the. Uh, Fabulous Craig Newmark School at the uh, City University of New York. And then the, the following week, we'll be together watching Google I.O. Yes, I'm excited about that. What date is that? That's May Five, the 10th. May 10th. May 10th. Uh, Jeff and I will cover the keynote. Uh, Jason Howell's going down for Google I.O. They're going to do a couple of shows down there all about Android. And I think they've got four or five Google folks uh, joining them to talk about Android and other things that Google's uh, up to. So... Uh, we'll have some good coverage of Google I.O. coming up in a couple of weeks. We do Twit every Sunday afternoon, 2 to 5 p.m. Pacific. I'm sorry, 2 to 5 p.m. Yeah, Pacific. Uh, that would be 5 to 8 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, and then I guess 2100 UTC if you want to tune in and watch live. The live streams, audio and video, are at twit.tv slash live. If you're watching live, chat live at irc.twit.tv. You could also join the Club Twit Discord. It wouldn't hurt you. Wouldn't hurt you. It's only seven bucks a month. You get ad free versions of all the shows. You get uh, the special shows we don't put out in public. A lot of shows that we're working on, like Scott Wilkinson's Home Theater Geeks, Hands on Mac, Hands on Windows, The Untitled Linux Show. Uh, and you get AI Leo, uh, who will send you a heart if you just but say hello. Uh, that is <laughs> twit.tv slash I don't know what that means that animated gift there are lots of them on there though twit.tv slash club twit and it really helps us it really uh, smooths out the bumps uh, between uh, advertisers uh, and helps us produce new content and keep the lights on so it, uh, it's a great way to, to support your favorite podcasts and get some great content too twit.tv slash club twit uh, after the fact, you get uh, free versions of the show ad-supported at our website. This Week in Tech is twit.tv. Twit.tv also has links to the YouTube channel for This Week in Tech. It also has uh, links to the various podcast players you can use. If you subscribe in one of them, you'll get it automatically the minute it's available, audio or video. Uh, that's about it for this week. What a great show. I thank you all for being here, and we'll see you next time. Another Twit is this in the can. Bye-bye.